Greetings, fellow Empyreans. I am Ashtarothy, the voice of New Eden, and it is April 11th, YC 126, and it is the Eve Universe Show! Welcome, welcome, welcome. Settle in. We have so much to cover today. Today is a big one. <clears throat> I, I, I hope we get through it all. I'll put it that way. Um, so, today, I got a wild hair... Are you serious? No. I, it is because I start talking. I'm sure that's what it is. Yeah. 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 Do you have something to say? To you? Do you want to come show your show? Say hi to the audience? No? You just want to say hi? Okay. Oh, you do want to come over? Yeah. All right. So today, uh, I got a wild hair and I, I went to go look for uh whether or not i'd covered mortus legion before i i i thought i had had hi okay let's no 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 you've done it now you've done it now you've done it your daily your daily dose of internet fame hi yeah you have a message for the people no okay the cat is reporting live from Gito 44. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I do want to cover all this. Uh, I found out, I, I don't think I've ever covered it before or even looked into it as much. So I decided to go through the effort of pulling together everything I could find about Mortis Legion today. And so I have pulled, uh, we have pulled together 97 or so tabs in my uh, Chrome browser. It, it was it was so bad that Punch had to uh, teach me how to use browser tab groups, which I, I, I up until that point had never thought about using before. And now I I I, I thank him for changing my my worldview. On, <laughs> but uh, yeah, no. So I have them divided into four basic categories, um, or you know, different timelines. But before we dump into that, because once we go into that, we're just never going to see the light of day. I do want to um, cover a little bit of news. The big one being this structure right here. This is the um, the FOB that is currently in. Oh boy, what system is this? Uh, Oymen. So the FOB in Oymen is currently vulnerable. Now I was. <coughs> uh, Alice's cat was the same way. As soon as the camera's on, you can see the cat wake up, go off his bed, and jump on the desk. Yeah, luckily mine doesn't uh, jump on the desk. This one doesn't. So, but um, also I miss hate list. Anyway, um, so I was corrected apparently that there has been a time in which the um, angels were uh, defeated by the counterinsurgents. Um, however. Just due to the nature of things, the Angel Cartel has not lost since the update that made it so that they we had to get more and more systems every time we win. So, you know, right now, the Angel Cartel have to capture 14 systems to uh, the eating, it's just the eating comp, to um, the counterinsurgency's seven. Um, however, it, or, it, and it's worth noting that, hold on, but, this time, the counterinsurgents have um, captured their seven systems, therefore completing their objective before the uh, angels were even able to complete their seven. So, um, like, even if this was the old school, school system, then the angels and Mimitar would have, sorry, the Amar and Mimitar would have beaten the angels to seven. Now, the counterinsurgents have an additional step that they must do in order to um you know complete the insurgency and win which is the destruction of the fob right 
uh, all the insurgents need to do is capture enough systems. The counterinsurgents need to, to capture enough systems and then assault the FOB itself. The FOB has two different fights. The first is its reinforcement timer, and the second is its final battle, I think is roughly within 24 hours of the reinforcement timer. Uh, and that's how the counterinsurgents win. Now, we covered a lot of this uh, yesterday, or sorry, Tuesday, including why I think this is happening. But um, it is true that at this point, the FOB is vulnerable. And if we look at it right now, we can see that the FOB has a timer on it of 7 hours, 38 minutes, and 34 seconds. And it is reinforced until... April 12th at 1.43.51. Uh, and that's Eve time. Okay, so that's... Uh, and so that would be... Uh, well, I mean, in, in eight hours, basically. Or in seven and a half hours from the timing of the... If you're watching this live. Uh, this structure will go back to being vulnerable. And then it can be destroyed. And if it's destroyed, then this will be the mark the first time that the counterinsurgents have won since the new insurgency system, or since the insurgency system was changed to include uh, the uh, ambition modifier, which means that the next insurgency will be the first time that the counterinsurgents have an ambition modifier. They'll have to capture eight to the, and, and the pirates will reset. So the pirates will have to get seven and the counterinsurgents will get eight. And then we'll see where it goes. So it seems, just by the nature of things, you know, the insurgency would have to win 10 more systems before the, within the next eight hours, basically, um, in order to win. So it looks like congratulations to the counterinsurgencies. Um, and they did manage to, well, does this cut off Amar and Kaldari, or hold on, Amar. So if we set destination to Amar, and then we set destination to Jita, set a waypoint, then we set to safer. Yeah, you can still get through without going through an insurgent system. So it looks like the counterinsurgents did manage to save the bridge between Jita and Amar this time. Yes, you could it, correct if if the suppressing forces manage to suppress all of the current active systems. In other words, they prevent the uh, the insurgents from spreading at all and they capture the initial, what is it, five systems, then, um, then they, they still enter that winning state where they can reinforce the structure. That's true. The, uh, the, the, the insurgents do not have that um, benefit, though. They have to capture the right amount of systems because the act of the insurgents capturing systems spreads the insurgency. So they will always have at least seven systems to take. All right, so that's what's going on there. <clears throat> Do, is there any other news going on right now? Malik, help me out. Was, what else were we supposed to talk about today before I jump into like any of the main topics? Uh, I get free for all is coming up soon. Uh, now I can't think of anything. All I can think about is Mortis Legion at this point. All right. Well, in that case, maybe it's time to jump into it. Let me go double check the Eve news, see if anything like quickly jumps out at me because I don't want to. I spent like seriously, guys, I've spent the last two and a half hours or something like that prepping for this. So I didn't even think. Oh, the big one is uh, the Vanguard announcement, which was that the other day I noticed that I got the Osprey Navy issue skin sent to me and now they have verified that basically likely because there was not enough people that qualified for the 2000 or mind uh they limited it down to 1000 
and therefore a whole bunch of additional people qualified retroactively and therefore got the skin. Uh, I think it was the correct thing to do. I still think that uh, the requirement system is incredibly, it's probably the, the biggest pain point right now, um, which is probably because it's, it's tacked on for the purposes of trying to reinforce uh, the play testing. But still, like giving having us rely on this system without giving us the support to actually know what our progress is um makes it feel very like almost snaky like you're tricking me into having to like i don't know when i'm done right i just have to keep going i never know if it's enough um especially with a requirement like 2000 so I know I put in the feedback that one of my most negative experiences with the playtest was, in fact, just the fact, you know, that that whole deal. Um, I'm sure I wasn't the only one saying that. So uh, hopefully this means that they're going to be dealing with stuff uh, better in the future. Lessons learned and all that. also there was um you know the the leaderboards have been put out um i probably know some of these people but i they, none of them jumping out at me i probably should know some of these people i'm not sure i know that i kept running into um a couple people I knew. A lot of the same people. <laughs> Who's this uh, uh, Ari Rara or whatever? Rana. Are they? Did they cheat or did they just do that much more than everybody else? That's what I want to know. <clears throat> what do you think about the war that's in live in wormhole space right now? I think it's very interesting. I think I don't know enough about what exactly is going on. And I know it's going to be something that I'm going to be interested in sifting through once there's like data out of it. Um, but yeah, I honestly don't know enough myself to have a, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's this big war going on in high class worm, uh, wormholes. And I've heard like tiddlings about this. Like somebody mentioned it during the MER and stuff. Uh, and I know that there's a post about it on Reddit, but I haven't like sat down and like, parsed out what's going on or had somebody like explain it to me yet so uh i i i with i withhold my opinion until i understand what's going on uh all right i think that's it so let's go ahead and jump into the main event today i want to talk about mordu's legion and its founder, Moria Mordu. So <clears throat> we're going to go over a little bit about like the origins of the Mordu's Legion and whatnot. And then we're going to have a probably pretty long uh, recounting and walkthrough of basically the history of um, EVE Online since its launch, like the lore. Because the Mordu's Legion has been around present and involved at least tangentially in a lot of the major conflicts in new eden in the last 25 years or so so um i have a bunch i have all of the i've taken every news article that i could possibly find that mentions mortis legion at all and i put them all in chronicle uh, chronological order along with some extra references that i'm going to use and we're going to just walk through it all i did omit a couple of things from there for instance, uh, uh, members that were doing things that were just described as being former Mortis Legion. I didn't really dig, I didn't go too far into it unless there is something that I could tie back to it. And there was a couple of times where Mortis Legion was like mentioned or was just a, an escort for something that didn't really seem to tie into any of the other things that were going on. It was just, of course, they were there, the mercs. So uh, I didn't really cover that. But with all that said, uh, let's go into the Mortis Legion. 
Mortis, Mortis Legion is a minor faction in New Eden and is formed by the military mastermind Moria Mordu after the Wachi Uprising. When he took many of the, his disenfranchised former Intaki troops who had been persecuted on Kamakor 4 by nationalists under his wing, their first action involved putting down the same uprising. They performed this task quickly and efficiently, establishing a trustworthy reputation that has remained to this very day. So basically, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to read this whole thing. I'm going to summarize it. Um, but the more, so during the Caldari Galente war, a lot of the Intaki were sympathetic to the Caldari's side of the fight, right? That, uh, it was pretty clear that the Galente were being kind of aggressive bullies, even before the bombardment, you know, trying to impose their will upon Caldari, uh, with their superior numbers within the Senate. And, you know, the Intaki are kind of, are also subject to the same uh, administration. So, you know, many of them thought that the Galente were in the wrong. And so a lot of Intaki sided with the Galente and the Caldari, as we looked at last week with the Intaki Syndicate, which <laughs> they come back up. Uh, they, uh, you know, many of them were rounded up and banished, but some of them actually totally defected and joined... Uh, the Caldari military, okay? So this group of Intaki loyal, or Intaki natives that uh, defected to the Caldari were formed into a single unit, and it was placed under the command of Brigadier General Moria Mordu. Okay? So then the war goes on, the war ends. At the end of the war... Uh, which had lasted for almost a century. Um, which, remember, this is towards the end of the war, right? So, at the end of the war, uh, the Intaki that was part of this group, right, they can no longer go back to the Galente. They've, they've defected. So, they're taken in by the Caldari, and they're granted a place in Washi City in Camador 4. Uh, here's the problem with that. The Caldari, we talk about like how decadent the Galente are and how, you know, the the religious corruption of the Amar, but we don't quite talk about the xenophobia of the Caldari nearly as much. But um, you know, the 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 Caldari's one of the Caldari's major defining characteristics is their xenophobia. It's one of the things that protected them against Galentian cultural influence. Because when Galente started to try to influence the Caldari culture, they repelled from it because of their, you know, built-in distrust of other people. So, um, in this case, though, what it led to was uh, a lot of mistreatment by the Caldari against the Intaki people in this uh, area, in which, which leads to... Um, uh, let's see. Many were the subject of victimization and xenophobic attacks, incidents that began to go unchecked by local authorities as well. Eventually, a full-blown uprising against the Caldari government began when Caldari authorities attempted to bring the city to order, having descended into almost daily violence. So, uh, you know, there's this these attacks and all these kinds of things going on, and then finally, the government comes in to try to stop this uh the the attacks on the intaki by the native kaldari um and this causes the native kaldari to uprise against the government okay so then moria mordu rounds up all of his so former you know his soldiers uh that were part of his former group pulls them together and um basically builds a, a new fighting force mercenary group and calls himself Mordu's Legion and then steps in to help the Caldari in dismantling the uprising. So this is why if you look in game at the Mordu's Legion ships like the um uh Garmer right if we open up the Garmer we can see one of the big skins that they have is these two Garmer Washi Uprising skins, right? It's these red ones. 
the shiny one and the non-shiny one. These are to commemorate this moment in which there was an uprising, a revolt of the Kaldari against their own government because of they were being stopped in their mistreatment of the Intaki people so on their on their planet. And so then this is the birth of the Mortis Legion. Sorry. I hid the wrong thing. Uh, this skin. Okay, back to the story. <clears throat> so, uh, from there, the Kaldari Navy offers Mordu's Legion an official station within the Navy itself. However, Mordu decides not to do that. He is done working with the Kaldari directly. And so, um, while they do retain close ties to the Kaldari, Mordu's Legion goes off and forms their own mercenary organization. Um, and you know, that, that, that's the establishment of Mortis Legion. Great. So, um, let's see. Anything else that's important here first? No, because this is everything that we're going to cover later. So let's talk about the man himself, Moria Mordu. Moria Mordu uh, was a Detis, um, which is a type of Kaldari. Um, on Hakonin three. it was clear that he was a very talented um military tactician um and he was promoted to um brigadier general uh he did planetary engagements throughout verge vendor and placid that was while he was captain uh it was his efforts in intaki and yc8 that began that he was to earn his mo the most renown so that's how late it was into the thing because like we're talking about after yc8 is after you know, the Uli conference. So theoretically speaking, the Galente Kaldari war is kind of winding down. Um, however, uh, so after several exchanges from the Woinki and Verret constellations, Verret is the constellation with, um, in fact, both of these are the constellations I think that were taken by the Galente uh, during uprising. So this is uh, the constellation that contains Intaki. Right? That's not... Wait, hold on. Now I'm double... Now I'm second-guessing myself. That's not the one with, um... Athanun, is it? Or... Yeah, it's the one with Intaki. Okay, good. Whew. Uh, the Condor under his command was attacked over Intaki 5. Mordu and the other crew had managed to survive the ship's destruction in their own subsequent descent to the planet were marooned on the surface. To Morden's apparent displeasure, he was informed that due to increased enemy presence following the exchange, rescue was going to be denied until orbit could be secured. Preparing themselves for an extended stay, they managed to rendezvous with the soldiers that they had been sent, they had been sent to extract. They had been set about trying to dig in, blend in, and secure passage off the planet themselves. After a deal sourced uh, with the local criminal contact, the men were sheltered by a sympathetic Intaki for a short time before the Kaldari Navy came for them. It was likely this experience that not only ensured Morty's further career path, but in many ways changed his perspective on his own dispensability, the darker side to his own character, particularly when in mortal combat, as well as his capacity to engage with others on a blunder and on a, a more human level than on a structured and authoritative one. So, um, this is, again, still before any of that stuff. Right, uh, any of uh, he becomes a commanding off, you know, the, the is before he's a general. So, um, Moria all, was also said to be more open minded than other Kaldari officers who generally tended towards xenophobia towards non Kaldari races, a boon of his upbringing amongst the more liberal uh, ideals insulated by the local to by those local to Ishikone, coupled with experience on Intaki 5. Mordu demonstrated that he was increasingly of the opinion that class or rank did not determine the character of a person, nor the level of expertise they, they possess. He would later be given the command of Intaki officers who had chosen to defect from the Galente Federation to join the Kaldari because uh, cause for independence. Made up of a mix of Navy and ground forces, Mordu was given the rank of Brigadier General with the formation of this brigade and charged with the continuation of the com com combination of fleet movements and ground skirmishes in enemy territory. 
So then in YC one uh, in YC twelve. So uh, just to double check. Uh oh, where was it? Gosh darn it! Where was the other year given? YC, YC eight, got it. So he was he became a captain in YC eight, um, and by YC twelve the conflict had ended. So he was he he was commanding this group for less than four years because this whole thing, including the extraction from Intaki, um, yeah, the efforts in Intaki was in YC eight. So four years between this event and the end of the war. Okay, then, as we read about earlier, in YC32, so again, uh, so 20 years later, two decades, uh, we have many were the subject of victimization and xenophobic attacks, incidents that were went unchecked by local authorities. Eventually, a full-blown uprising against the Caldari government began in YC32 when Caldari authorities attempted to bring the city to order after almost daily violence. And Taki were being forcibly removed from their homes and brutalized after several deaths, the Intaki War veterans called upon the assistance of their old commander to quell the Washi uprising. Moria Mordu agreed to help his fellow soldiers and formed a mercenary group which consisted mainly of those Intaki War veterans. While they had all retired from active service, they assisted the Kaldari authorities to crush the uprising with the same efficiency that had uh, defined them during the war and started referring to themselves as Mordu's Legion. Okay. So, um, yeah. They begin to poach from the Caldari Navy. And then, okay, here's where things get, here's the next big thing. Mordu was cloned shortly after the creation of the transneural burn scanner interface after being approached directly by Ortro Garyushi in YC-104. Okay, so I was talking about the other day that the the cloning technology wasn't 100 years old, um, just the pod was. I guess the cloning technology was still pretty new in uh, YC-104. So, Okay, it didn't actually take very long for them to marry the capsule and the clone, it would seem, once they got cloning figured out. At any rate, uh, despite concerns about his advanced age and the transplantation of consciousness into a younger clone body through force of will, the application of wealth, and gracious cooperation of Ishikoni scientists, the procedure was a success. So, just to be clear, Mordu's pretty old at this point, okay? He's a captain in YC-8 and a brigadier general in YC-12, and then, what, 90 years later? No. What is it? 98? Hold on. I'm dumb. Whatever. M longer than a human lifetime. <laughs> uh, later, he gets cloned. So he's old, old. So that's what they mean by the, by this. This isn't just like a uh, you know he's too young to learn to be a Jedi thing, you know. This is his brain has begun to deteriorate, but we're still going to try to clone him thing. It has been noted that Mordu cloning resulted in increase in, increase in his eccentricity and per, per, peculiar brand of humor, said to be connected to complications that arose as a result of his advanced age at the time. He has himself dismissed any concerns as to his behavior as a result of his new lease on life he has gained. Always a man who believed in, in integrity and speaking one's mind, Moria notably became even more expressive, occasionally offensively so. He also started wearing more garish attire, including a variety of hats. Allies in the Legion would attest that this would cover up his custom implants, which featured prominently along the sides of his scalp and began behind his ear. There are suggestions that his costumes was instead the clearest symptom of irregularities in his behavior alongside the increasingly blacker warped sense of humor and tendency to refer to conversations he'd had with those he had just he'd murdered even long after their death. Morty's cloning was ultimately justified as being an asset to the Caldari cause and chance to experiment with the cloning of a significantly older subject. It became clear, however, that the deal had been made between the CEO of Ishikone, once a member of the Garistas, and Moria Mordu in the leading year in the years leading up to the death of Ortro Guriushi in YC-110, Mortis Legion performed several key operations against the assets of the hated Garistas. Based on intelligence provided by Ishikone CEO, these precision strikes were led by a much more youthful figure who the Legion still referred to as the Old Man. 
Subsequent recruits to the Legion assumed that this title was in reference to Mordu's patriarchal concern for his men. Uh, okay. So, just as an example of his eccentricity, here is a passage from uh, Templar 1, where it says, um, There is a handsome, handsome Galantee encapsulator in the room with a kind, tired eyes. He introduced himself reluctantly after no one bothered to. She could tell that he was new here and not entirely welcome above aboard his ship. Objectively, Jonas would have been a different man than the one she remembered to assemble the group, but it was far easier to latch onto emotional reasoning, which, uh, which told her that deep down, no one ever truly changes. But Mordu's appearance reinforced the notion that Jonas was the same as he always was, running with the crowd of like-minded minded megalomaniacs, arrogance like company. The little Drake that could, Mordu said, wearing on his head a model of a Revelation-class dreadnought that was snapped in two, one half covering each ear, and a crude model of a drake sat triumphantly perched up tom, uh, pop, uh, on top of his scalp. The Morse has officially become legendary. Well done! So, he gets a hat made to commemorate this guy's victory with his drake. Like, that's, that's what they mean by ridiculous hats, just so we know. So we're on the same page. Uh, all right. <clears throat> and then finally, in order to uh, kind of get us ready to go with the history of things, I have... Oh, wait, no, sorry. Mordu's Legion Command. I do have this one. So, um, the... Let's see. Oh, this doesn't actually say anything really new. Yeah. So let's read this. This is the Mortis Legion Chronicle from YC103, which is 2001. This is before the release of the game. The Caldari state, with its mega corporations and millions of smaller companies form the fabric, uh, forming the fabric of society, hasn't always poised the unify, as unified front as it does today. Several times in its history, since the state was birthed following the break from the Galente Federation, rival factions and companies have clashed, often with deadly intent. Most of the time, the cause of conflict is of an um, economical nature, but every now and then, ideology and political differences are the cause. One of these incidents was the Wa Washi Uprising, which took place a few decades ago in the Kamakor system. Then, a few radical Kaldari attacked settlements of Intakis in the system and proclaimed that the Kaldari state was solely the people of Kal for the people of Kaldari origin. The Kaldari Authority, as ever fearful of their finely woven social tapestry of corporations, would soon be torn asunder, sent their best military units to quell the uprising before it could spread any further. The Washi uprising did not leave any permanent marks on Kaldari society. Still, it did leave one legacy that has carried on to this very day, and that is Mordus Legion. When the Kaldari broke from the Cal Galente Fort Federation, many Antakis that sympathized with their causes were exiled from the Federation. The most militants of those were, went over to the Kaldari and asked to join them in their fight against the Federation. These were all experienced military personnel and thus very valuable to the early stages of the war when veterans were few and far between. The Antakis were all, but, uh, all put into a separate squadron for the Kaldari officer. His name was Moria Mordu. Mordu is a brilliant young officer and one of the most more open-minded Kaldari who generally are extremely xenophobic. He immediately took to the Intakis and they, took, uh, they to him, and together they formed one of the most revered fighting units in the Kaldari Navy during the war with the Federation. After the war ended, the Intakis were offered cheap land and accommodation in Washi City on the planet of Kamakor IV. For a while, the Intakis le lived peacefully, slowly becoming part of the Washi community. Yet the presence of the Intaki caused tension in the city, and slowly radicals, feeding on the xenophobic tendencies of the Kaldari, gained strength. In the end, the radicals gained a majority in the city and began seriously harassing the Intaki. When Kaldari authorities tried to put an end to this uprising, uh, this, the uprising started in earnest, with the radicals and their supporters demanding the exploration of all foreigners and the closure of the borders. The Intakis were driven out, and in desperation, they called on their old commander, Mordu, to help them defend themselves and get back to what was rightfully theirs. Mordu, now retired, agreed to assist. The catch was that Mordu and the Antakis were no longer part of the Kaldari Navy. Not deterred by this small fact, the group formed an independent mercenary corps to fight the radicals. This was the inception of Mordu's Legion. 
The Legion, mostly consisting of old veterans from the war with the Federation and young hotheads eager for action, helped the Caldari Navy to tear the Radicals' forces to pieces under the skillful direction of Mordu. The Caldari authorities were impressed by the fighting spirit of the Legion and offered to merge it with the Caldari Navy. Mordu and the other leaders of the Legion declined, deciding rather to focus on the uh, mercenary nature of the Legion. In the years since, the Mordus Legion has grown in stature. Today, it is the largest and most famous mercenary corps in the world of EVE. The Legion has always had close ties to the Caldari state, and the two assist each other on many ventures. At first, the Legion accepted only citizens of the Caldari state, but now they accept members of it from any race, as long as they are not known as enemies to the Caldari state. Still, the majority of the members of the Caldari origin and the leaders are all Caldari. The Legion does not train its members, so they are expected to be experienced fighters before they apply for membership to the Legion. Members of the Legion get access to high-tech Caldari military equipment, even prototype weapons to test out, and are guaranteed plenty of employment if they so wish. Non-Caldari that are served with the Legion for a long time are offered Caldari citizenship on their retirement. The Legion is often employed by governments to settle issues that are not directly under anyone's jurisdiction, especially when fast deployment and swift results are needed. Their reputation as combat experts as well as fair and honest warriors has never been tarnished. Okay, so... That is where we are at, at the beginning of this story. The first piece of the story begins. Uh, the, I've divided this story into four, five time periods. The pre-dust period, dust in Operation Highlander, upwell, invasions, and the modern day. <clears throat> now. Hold on, let me close some of these so that way when I open this, I can still see things. Can I? Eh, close enough. All right, so it begins... It, we have to... Uh, we've talked about Outer Ring Excavations and a lot of these other groups in previous videos. Um, so if you want more information, I, I recommend checking those out or ask about them in the comments below or on the Discord. Uh, we will be digging into a few rabbit holes here, but um, I'm trying to keep out anything that it doesn't like help put context to the Legion, um, because otherwise this stuff spirals out of control. That said, I do want to give you a little bit of background on Orr. Orr uh, was... Oh my god. I don't even have it open right now. Why are you doing this? Uh, so Outer Ring Excavations was founded by a guy named Yanni uh, Ateru, I think. Um, and he found some spot of main out in the Outer Ring and, you know, managed to keep it from the Glente and made tons of money off of it. Found his own corporation called Or, made tons and tons and tons of money. And during this time, he uh, started doing, uh, basically hired Mortis Legion to be their security forces. Now, uh, after some time, shortly before YC-106, I think YC-105, maybe, um, the uh, Yanni stepped down as the CEO of Orr and handed it over to his partner and co-founder, Orion Michel. Um, that brings us to this story. Orion Michel, the founder of Outer Rings Excavation Company, is known to, for his secluded nature. He never travels far, uh, travels outside a fortress like home in the Heart Constellation and very rarely invites visitors. Thus, when he meets with someone, it is always a point of considerable interest for the press and is now chewing over what Ma Mashal's meeting with Moria Mordu, leader of Mordu's Legion Mercenary Corps, means, especially in light of the Legion's guard or property. In, light, in the light, the Legion guards or property in the outer regions. The two met yesterday at Marshall's, Marshall's spra sprawling complex. The meeting lasted more than two hours, and Mordu left. He was visibly upset, but he declined to comment to the media, waiting outside, and left in a hurry. Calls for Michelle himself were not returned. Orion Michelle founded Orr several decades ago when the private corporations were first taking the tentative steps outside of Empire Space. His company grew rich trading in Noxium which back then was in heavy demand, or established itself in the Outer Ring region and surrounding areas, scouting out the system better than anyone before or since. The company is thought to know the location of fabulously wealthy asteroid fields deep in space, which they mine slowly so as to not flood the market. 
Michelle withdrew from the public eye some half a century ago and has since lived almost as a hermit in the midst of the outer region. But he still manages to be well informed about the going ons inside the com court, uh, outside world. And the few times he has stuck his neck out, it has always turned out to be a transitional period for his company, either to save it from looming threats or expand its already great fortune to even greater heights. Now we are left wondering what the meeting between Michelle and Mordu portrays. Is there some impending de doom waiting to fall on Orr? Are we witnessing yet another chapter in its extraordinary success story? <clears throat> oh, seven, Jeff. All right. So, what are they up to? What are they up to? Uh, three days later. This morning, Moria Mordu arrived at his headquarters with the bulk of his task force. Despite harassment from the Guardian Angels and one major confrontation, only a handful of ships were lost. Mordu's waited no time upon his arrival. Wait, did I skip something? Hold on. Am I already... I am. I got the wrong ones. Uh, this is earlier in the same day. It was the same day. Moria Mordu, the venerated leader of the Mortis Legion, has ordered for a full mobilization of the Legion's forces. According to sources inside of the Legion, Mordu is putting together a task force with strike capabilities, which he intends to lead himself. Legionaries everywhere are left be uh, bewildered by this development, as no explanation has followed in the wake of this order. Pilots on leave has been recalled to duty, and ships in dry docks hurried back into service. The biggest employer of the Legion in recent years has been Orr, charged with the Legion... Charging the Legion to protect its property of ore against encroaching piracy in the hands of the Guardian Angels and others. There's little doubt that this mobilization is the result of st a, the stormy meeting Moria Mordu had with the elusive Orion Michelle of Or. Though the content of that meeting remains secret, one can only surmise that Michelle put the screws on Mordu, using the strong financial grip Or has on the Legion to leverage to get Mordu to agree on whatever scheme Michelle is, ha Michelle is hatching. <clears throat> Until now, Orr has not been known to dabble in power politics or to use undue force. So a strike against its neighbor is thought to be unlikely. If an attack is imminent, the most likely candidate are the Guardian Angels or even the Intaki Syndicate, though the purpose of such an attack are a complete mystery. Until the task force is assembled and on the move, it's anyone's guess what Orr and Mortis Legion are up to on the outskirts of civilized space. So again, like later that same day, Right? Is this true? Hold on. Seven. Am I? I feel like I'm going crazy here. YC 106, 723. YC 106, 723. So, yeah, same day. This morning, Moria Mordu arrived at his headquarters with the bulk of his task force. Despite harassment from the Guardian Angels and one major confrontation, only a handful of ships were lost. Mordu wasted no time on his arrival. He called the leaders of the Legion to an emergency meeting and then proceeded to deploy his forces around outer region in case the Guardian Angels sent a retaliation force. Speculations have been ripe over what Mordu's mission in Serpentis space was, as it was obviously neither a raid nor an all-out attack. Am I missing still another story? I don't know why. This seems out of order, but we'll just keep going. Um, the strange device used by Mordu's flagship point to Orr, being a company with deep pockets and steeped in secrecy, it has always been an easy scapegoat for conspiracy theorists when it comes to strange occurrences in the Outer Ring Gene region outer region area whether this was a reconnaissance or espionage mission of some sort as the most popular conspiracy theories declare it is impossible to tell at the moment but anything that makes orion michelle and the usually conservative moria mordu stick out their necks in such a fashion is surely nothing trivial in nature then four days later supposedly a mortis legion task force under the leadership of mordu's Moria Mordu inf himself infiltrated Serpentis space in the Fountain region yesterday and moved deep into its territory. The task force refrained from any... Yeah, I don't know why it's out of order. The task force refrained from any direct conflict with Guardian Angel ships or Serpentis ships. Instead, the task force headed straight for Serpentis Prime in the Phoenix constellation and approached the chemical refinery orbiting the second moon of Serpentis Prime 8. As the station readied its defenses, Mordu's task force halted and orbited the station at exactly 30 kilometer distance. Mordu then empower, employed an unknown device from his flagship, a device that radiated purple greenish light and pulsed like a quasar. The device was aimed at the Serpentis station for several minutes before disappearing again into Mordu's ship. The task force then prominently left 
and headed out of system before the pirates could muster a response team. According to latest news, Mordu is still on the prowl deep inside of Serpentis territory, though avoiding any direct confrontation with pirate forces as before. Considering the strength of the Serpentis and the Guardian Angels, it is remarkable that the Legion has managed to bypass their defenses with such ease. Perhaps Mordu has a strange, more strange devices on board, one that helps them get around unnoticed. If so, did he get them from Orr? And where did Orr get them? So, I don't know if anybody in the comments uh, knows the if something came out with this device. I don't actually know whether like what that is. <clears throat> uh, however, the next month in August, wow, geez, my voice. This is not good. <clears throat> the task force led by Moria Mordu into Serpentis space was pinned down yesterday by Guardian Angels led forces led by Brian Gerdola and Stel Steely Shellen and forced into combat. The Guardian Angels have been trying to counter Mordu ever since the latter entered into the Fountain region, but he has always managed to slip out of their grasp just when they thought they had him. Whether this is due to Mordu's tactical brilliance or the aid of unknown gadgets at his disposal is not known, but it was until the equally brilliant Jerdola and Shellen arrived on the scene that Mordu's luck finally ran out. It was Mordu's space blinker. He was just trying to, like, send a signal, right? We come in peace in, in binary. Uh, the battle that ensued lasted more than an hour, but the clever defensive strategy employed by Mordu kept losses at a minimum. In the end, the Guardian Angels retreated to lick their wounds and rally their troops for another assault. But in the meantime, Mordu withdrew his for task force in an orderly fashion, not willing to take his chances again against the much larger forces that the Guardian Angels could muster on, it, on their home ground. Having seemingly completed his mission, Mordu has now left Serpentis space and is heading back to his headquarters. Does anyone guess whether or not whether this, his mission can be deemed a success or not? But at the very least, it has stirred the Guardian Angels, embarrassed by how easily Mordu managed to penetrate their perimeter defenses and slip deep into Serpentis territory. Some sort of retaliatory attacks, either on the Legion or on Orr, the Legion's employer and supposed instigator of this operation, is thought to be l likely, so spacefarers in the area are urged to show caution. The factions, other factions in Fountain Region are understandably concerned over the whole episode, and have demanded an explanation from Mortis Legion or Or for the reasons of this unwanted incursion into their territory. Uh, Dama Klaas, uh, co-chairman of the Fa Fountain Alliance Council, said Mordu must explain his actions in person, otherwise the wrath of the FA would be felt. A spokesperson for Or tried to placate the irri irritated FA by asserting that Mordu's mission was not aimed, quote, in any way whatsoever, end quote, at any members of the FA, but solely against the Serpentis Corporation. The spokesperson declined to go into details about Mordu's mission, but said that Or and the Legion offered their sincerest apologies to members of the FA for not informing them of their imminent incursion. It is... The, it was the hope of the leaders of Orr and the Legion that relations with the FA could be restored to their usual good status despite this small oversight. So yeah, this seems to clearly be like before that other story. So that's so weird. Either way. Uh, and that's kind of the end of that little story as far as I know, right? Um, however, what we see here is, you know, Mordu is used more or less against his will by uh, the leader of Orr against Serpentis, right? Because Orr doesn't like the Serpentis. Moria didn't like this, but was kind of coerced into doing it, it would seem. Um, and as a result of this, it kind of weakened Orr's position with the serpent, uh, with the, um, with ore. Hey, Jeff, thank you for that. Uh, the task force led by Moria Mordu, this is <clears throat> in August, into Serpentis space was pinned down yesterday by Guardian Angels. Uh, wait, no, we just read that one. That's the one we just read. Yeah. So next, the ne in the next year, right? So, Six months later, the Orr Syndicate 
the largest mining corporation in the galaxy, was in trouble earlier this week when an escort for a convoy of their industrial ships heading out of the Syndicate region failed to turn up. The Mortis Legion fighters have a contractual agreement with, Cor with Orr to protect their industrial convoys from attacks by Serpentis and other pilots who frequently frequent the Syndicate region. According to Orr's spokesperson, this was the first time that they have not showed up at the appointed time. They are taking this breach of contract very seriously and are said to be inquiring as to the cause. Desperate for an escort uh, on the hazardous run, however, the industrious pilots took a leap of faith and recruited an escort from the pilots in the local commun communication channel, most of wh whom swore from supremacy, but most of whom were from Supremacy Corporation. Those are players. The fears of individual pilot, uh, sorry, the fears of the industrial pilots were well founded. However, in K five TAC JRD, the convoy was attacked by a contingent of Serpentis pilots. The battle was over quickly. The forces of the convoy completely overwhelmed by the surprise Serpentis attack squad. There are no more attempts to, uh, made to attack the convoy after that. The convoy safely. Hold on. Oh yeah, the force. So the convoy's defenses, i.e., Supremacy Corporation, whoop the Serpentis. The convoy safely made it back to uh, Poiton and wasted no time in informing their superiors of the situation. Had it not been for the actions of these pilots, then the Serpentis Corporation would have been tri would have triumphed, placing a harsh blow into Orr Syndicate's operation. Orr has expressed their gratitude to escort pilots, praising their bravery in what was a highly unusual situation. So the reason why this is important is because it's showing like Mordu has an impeccable record, right? Everything about them is about how great they are, how effective they are, and, you know, how dependable they are. And here, they don't show up. This kind of shows a, a, a sign of the growing tension between uh, Mordu and, hey, V-Rod, thank you for that. On behalf of R2, thanks for that. V-Rod Cruiser. Good to see you again. Uh, all right, so either way. By the way, guys, if you hear somebody that's like, man, I, haven't, I, I wish Ash would start making videos again. There's a lot of people that haven't seen that I've started doing live videos again, so let them know. <clears throat> uh, the Mortis Legion fighters... Okay, so... Uh, Sorry, like I said, this is showing a strain between Mortis Legion and Orr. Mortis Legion meets DCM on a, in a cloud of conspiracy theories. Pilots from all over Caldari State were unexpectedly called to arms earlier this week by security forces from Deep Core Mining Inc. The security forces sent the many pilots they hired out to scout and secure solar systems surrounding the Para system, and more specifically the DCM station, immediately. The pilots were... In, not made aware of what they were looking for, only to report back suspicious pirate activity. When they were given the reason for the mission, however, the reason for the lack of details became apparent. They were scouting out the systems, clearing all opposition to make way for a Mordu's convoy of unknown purpose. When the pilots found out who they were working for, the seeds of dissension began to spread. One pilot who wishes to remain nameless broke the wall of secrecy surrounding the, this operation to speak to me, saying, quote, he didn't trust the Mordu's further than he could throw them. This is the second time that both the Legion and DCM have been discovered to be pulling off unusual activity in the last week. Several days ago, a Legion escort mission didn't show up to protect a convoy of Aura Industrials out of the Syndicate region, and DCM were embarrassed just a day before that particular incident when a trader who sold many delicacies, such as spice wine and long limb rose, spoke out in public communications channel asking if the purchases were related. Embarrassed, the DCM representatives, who seemed to try to co cover it up, Sources within Deep Core Mining claim that one executive has been fired over the incident, although we cannot get official confirmation at this point. Why DCM didn't use their own security forces for this operation is the subject of speculation. Some parties, mostly the pirate pilots hired, believe this is because DCM's security forces could not hope to match the experience and firepower that the pilots themselves brought. Wilts, others believe that it's because DCM executives were trying to keep the, the, this operation as low creek. Oh, jeez. This operation as low key, this operation low key. Whilst others believe it is because the DCM executives were trying to keep this operation low key and secretive, and amassing their forces would arouse suspicion. Certainly, the local DCM executives 
were adamant that information was not released to anyone. We do not have further information about the convoy, as all pilots were paid and dispersed. However, this event is becoming less likely to have a mundane reason by the second. All right. Then... Four months later. Although mere conjecture until recent hours, numerous credible yet confidential sources have confirmed that diplomatic ties between Orr and the Mortis Legion have deteriorated to a breaking point. The relationship between the two powers over recent months have proven to be strained with a commonly held view that the sources of the friction has arisen from disputes between the two faction leaders. Both Orion Michelle, the founder of Outer Ring Excavation Company, and Moria Mordu, the leader of Mortis Legion Mercenary Corporation, had a history of public personal conflict, a factor that may prove to be the source of recent sudden drop in mutual cooperation. The sources of the hostilities remain a mystery with no official comment regarding the, each of the groups standing to the other, but it is believed that due to feelings within the Legion regarding apparent stagnation of, at the hands of continued service of ore. Already reports have been issued by members of the pod pilot community regarding the amassing of Mortis Legion in critical ore locations uh, upon the eastern flank of, of ore systems. Although not outwardly aggressive, the movement of Mortis Legion personnel and assets to central locations has sparked deep-rooted concern within the local populace. We shall bring you more information as the situation develops. Articulation implant malfunction? Man, this is why I edit my videos. Uh, from bad to worse. In what seems to confirm... Re Previous reports about the diplomatic ties between Orr and Mortis Legion deteriorating almost to a breaking point. An Orr convoy of three cargo ships was left waiting by its Mortis escort yesterday in 4C Pack B7X. Already behind schedule, Chief Orr Transport Pilot Zenu Breed decided to turn to local freelance pilots for help. Showing their talent for diplomacy, Breed managed to convince Lekosa from the Imperium. This is, by the way, not the Imperium that you know, right? The Imperium as in the modern day, is a coalition of alliances. This is the Imperium Alliance. Okay. Uh, now defunct, as far as I know. From the Imperium and Shivaja from NORAD to strike a temp temporary ceasefire on their ongoing hostilities and provide the Ore Convoy with some help reaching Galente-controlled space. With the forces Sivja... Sivaja and Lekosia were able to put together and unwilling to remain in unsecured space any longer, Breed decided to move towards their destination. After successfully fending off an attack by two Serpentis ships, the convoy confronted a TRS gate camp, which proved to be above their forces. While awaiting for reinforcement, TRS operatives attacked the convoy, bringing down one of the ore transports. According to reports, downed ore pilot Sakota Frendorn's pod was spared and allowed to reach Orville after toll was negotiated. They ransomed her. Uh, when contracted about the, this episode, Captain Agutiger Adinger from Orr Security publicly thanked both the Imperium and Norad representatives for their help. About the missing Morty ship, um, Adinger commented, quote, Disappointing, but not entirely unexpected. There was a time when Mortis Legion was the symbol of professionalism. Nowadays, they don't seem to be able to even show up on time. The Legion is certainly not up to their legendary reputation anymore. Our, uh, end quote, uh, our legal, sorry, our legal branch has already initiated the corresponding actions to receive compensation for our losses, end quote. Uh, wait, doesn't Orr still use Mortu security, but their history is not so perfect, eh? We'll get there, Punch. The ties between, uh, this is now five Five days later, you are you're about seven years ahead, I think. No, more like ten. As ties between the Or Syndicate and Mortar Legion are at an all-time low. Remember, guys, I want to stress to you guys two things. First of all, most of this stuff is happening in game. These are just live events that just happen, very similar to the live events that are kind of just happening now in relationship to the lead up to the summer expansion. You know, the the convoys and everything that's going on. Actually, very there's a strange amount of echoes in this story, isn't there? But um, uh. The other thing is, is that it's worth noting that we are in 2005, okay? 
You know, this is literally the second year of Eve. Like we, this, this game, this story starts in the very first year of Eve's history. Okay, so <clears throat> to put this into perspective, like Eve, be the plot of Eve Online begins with the deterioration of Or and Mortis Legion. As the ties between Or Syndicate and Mortis Legion are at on an all-time low, the populace of the Pure Blind region wonder about things to come. After only a few days in the region, it quickly becomes obvious that the presence of Mortis Legion pilots has decreased. A good thing, some might say, but not according to local citizens I have spoken to. Although Mortis Legion is considered a pirate faction by the empires, the people living close to them describe them as honorable, at times unpredictable pilots. Many fear that the withdrawal of Mortis forces will lead to a destabilization in the area, leaving them prone to what they consider pirates. When asked about what the future of the Legion would look like, speculations range, range from regrouping at one of their core systems to the closing down of the unit. Yet, other, yet others, although they seem to be a minority for now, fear that Orion Michelle, the founder of Or, has enraged Mor Moria Mordu to such an extent that an assault on Or assets might be on the verge. What remains for a fact is that Mordu's pilots are on the move, but where they are headed remains a mystery for now. Mortis Legion hunts and kills Serpentis Battleship. So this is about a month later. I wonder if they plan to turn Mordu into their own established faction to fight incursions. Uh, well, Upwell. Mordu is a member group of Upwell. That's the secret. Uh, Commander Jamma Mera Meyer. Head of Mortis Legion Security Division and 5ZXX Tech K officially confirmed what was now only a rumor, now was a rumor only. Serpentis operatives are being actively hunted by Mortis fortune, forces in the Placid region. News arrived a few days ago about Serpentis battleships being destroyed in conjunction with freelance pod pilot forces, yet no Mortis official has commented until today. A Serpentis Megathron was tackled, uh, tracked down to the Maklaminimod system by three men. Mordu squad under the command of Lieutenant Amerlik, Amerik Raun, confirmed Commander Mayor. Lieutenant Raun offer, opted to, for a careful approach to the situation. Retreating to Orville, he managed to enroll six freelance pilots who were deemed more than enough at the task at hand. Upon returning to Maklaminimod, all Stargates were secured as per the standard procedure and the system scanned. The available firepower easily disposed the hostile battleships as soon as it was found. Mayor refused to comment on the notorious decrease in Mortis pre presence in the Outer Ring sector and or its effect on Serpentis activity in the region. No other Mordu official was available for comment. Another Mordu convoy attacked in Outer Ring. This is, yeah, a month later. Under attack from NORAD and the Imperium forces, a Mordu convoy managed to evacuate the 4C Tech B7X station last Thursday. A fleet comprised of somewhere between 18 to 20 Mortis ships and the additional cover of reportedly tw nearly 20 freelance pilots traveling on a courier mission to the 4 SeaTac B7X system to retrieve Legion assets met a hostile combined forces of NORAD Imperium vessels. According to Mordu convoy leader Lieutenant Amerlik Raun, operatives of the M from MC, Kane, Karn, and PIXE provided cover while Legion ships docked, retrieved their cargo, and left the system. After regrouping in PF TAC 346, the majority of freelance pilots escorted the fleet safely to the Legion's headquarters in 5ZXX TAC K. The assets were reported as highly classified. We are not authorized, quote, we are not authorized knowledge of their nature, said convoy wingman Lieutenant Ome Hitmo. Hitmo. The reasons for NORAD and Imperium hostilities towards Mortis vessels is not clear at this moment. Lieutenant Ron reported the attackers acted on grounds of supposed territory ownership, claiming that neutral vessels were not allowed to fly through the system. 4 CTEC B7X is under OR sovereignty. As reported in early June, OR Mordu's relation turned sour after Mordu's failed to show up to protect OR transports and thus forcing OR to request escorting assistance to NORAD Imperium forces in the area. Yet it is unknown if this episode is related to recent hostilities. Rumors have surfaced this week about Mordu's and OR finishing their contract due to recent tensions, though there have been no official confirmation on this subject. Clearly this happened back when the battleship was actually a threat. Exactly. Battleships were big deals, man. So by September, 
In an earlier broadcast from unknown source, data apparently taken from the highly guarded communication system of the Mortis Legion has indicated a flurry of activity in the wake of last week's exodus from Or space. In particular, communications have pointed to the office of a senior member of the Legion staff, an individual that is yet to be identified from the snippets of seized data circulating throughout the black markets of the information community. The events of last week have seen widespread departure of the Legion from Or space in the wake of a dispute between the highest levels of the group administration. The incident, marked with political trauma, culminated in a disastrous relocation of the Legion's primary headquarters, a move that involved a number of casualties for local pod pilots claiming, uh, laying claim to the area. Military analysis has speculated that the common flight commander of Mortis operations during the movement, Lieutenant Amerlich Raun, may have been chastised for the recent loss of Mortis shipping and perhaps even demoted to a lower rank, with command being reassigned to another officer. Recent localized activity by patrol forces around the Legion's primary station indicates a noticeable rise in the organization's operations, with a number of notable combat vessels being called from patrol duty. Legion representatives have remained unavailable for comment in the recent apparent lapse in their security procedures, nor have they responded to questions on their plans for the near future. So, I don't know if it's going to go into this or if we're going to catch this in this storyline, but it's one thing that's worth noting that during all of this, around this time, the Serpentis strike back from against Orr by purchasing Orr. Serpentis more or less secretly purchase 51% of Outer Ring Excavation and take charge of Orr. They don't change anything, and they kind of try to lay low with that fact, but... From this point on, Orr is actually um, owned by the Serpentis. And the, the, the Orr's uh, falling out with Mordu really weakened Orr quite a bit, led to that being able to happen. <clears throat> so then later that same month, during a routine tour of their new home space last weekend, a Mortis Legion patrol received assistance from a number of resident Kepsley organizations operating in the pure, pure blind region. Upon learning of the patrol's intentions, the Capsular contingent, made primarily of pilots from Cutting Edge Incorporated and Blade Runners, offered their services in securing the area. Reinforcements by these numbered, numerous Capsular vessels, the patrol now numbering over 20 ships, was led by Lieutenant Amerlik Ron, made a qu clean sweep through the Mor all Morty system without encountering any problems. Oddly enough, this is the first time Ron has been seen leading a Morty's wing since the rumors of his demotion began to circulate in the wake of the Legion's exodus from Or Space though Legion officials are remaining tight-lipped as to whether this rumor is true or not. Uh, reports come soon came flooding in, specifying that hostile vessels uh, thought to be of Ascendant Frontier were disrupting traffic in East... I know them. EC Tech P8R Solar System, a known pirate hotspot with vital trade route for northern fringes of space. The Legion patrol was quickly dispatched to investigate and disperse the hostile forces without any altercation. CEI and Blade Runners, members of the newly found Razor Alliance, apparently share a mutually a newly founded Razor Alliance. Woo wee! Uh, apparently share a mutual interest with Mortis Legion in keeping the Pure Blind region safe. An opinion which was stated in a press release posted by the Galnet Communication Network on Monday. Speaking of the statement, Kilgord, CEO of Cutting Edge Incorporated, explained. That both corporations had, quote, a long and distinguished history throughout the northern and western regions of EVE, end quote, and went on to say that Razor were, quote, active in securing the interests in free and open pure blind region with a strong anti pirate stance, end quote. The Razor Alliance has seemed to have earned a new friend with their actions this weekend, with unconfirmed reports standing, uh, that standings between Mortis Legion and Razor Alliance has been adjusted to reflect this apparently amicable coexistence. Uh, sorry, uh, at the end of the year, November 15th, YC-107, activities in Pure Blind has seen an increase with Mordus Legion and Razor Alliance pilots operating in this, legion, or in this region. So we're seeing further cooperation between Mordus Legion and the player group Razor Alliance. Initially, the patrol last Thursday surrounding the... I found Razor Alliance, guys! Uh, Thursday surrounding the 5Z XX Tech K systems culminated in the establishment of no-fly zone around Mordus testing facility. Designed to ensure a successful deployment of two Phoenix-class Dreadnoughts belonging to the Legion. This is when Le Dreadnoughts were still pretty hot. In fact, this might be their introduction. I don't even know. Uh, three days later, another patrol was launched, first covering all systems surrounding 5Z XX Tech K, then proceeding on to Toranos, where the patrol reformed into an escort fleet for a Razor Freighter designated, de 
des destined to return to 5Z XX Tech K. Heated exchanges between patrol, the patrol and Jericho fraction pilots were reported to have taken place during an, this second operation, with a warning issued by the Legion pilots against further harassing of Razor pilots by members of Jericho fraction. Two Legion pilots stand out in these respect in these events. Lieutenant Amerlik Ron, who is believed to have recently been demoted from his position of common uh, flight commander due to losses sustained to the Legion during its withdrawal from Orr space, and Colonel Akuris, who is believed to have taken Ron's former post. Both pilots were unavailable for comment. The arrival of two dreadnoughts and two high-ranking officials of Mortis Legion in the system, namely Major Koina Halia and the Colonel, each piloting a dreadnought, leaves a large portion of the universe wondering what exactly the Legion has planned for this region. Wasn't the whole Mordu Phoenix thing around the same time they showed up? They showed the Vanguard character carrier? I don't know, man. This is all way before my time. Uh, then, two days later, yesterday the Syndicate region and the Orville Star System witnessed a bloodbath as Mortis Legion engaged multiple groups of pilots in the PF Tax 346 system. The Legion, under the command of Lieutenant Amerlik Ron, gathered together in a fleet of, with their allies, Razor Alliance. Their mission was to patrol the Syndicate region of space and search for any NORAD or Imperium pilots they found. Setting forth at 1900 hours, their first and second waypoints in the 3K, NK, TAC A, and 3MOG, TAC V systems yielded no hostiles. Recon reports indicated, however, that a large fleet from the NORAD Alliance was massing in the Orville system. Lieutenant Ron made the decision with Razor Command to return back to Orville. It was in PF TAC 346, the uncontrollable re system next door to Orville, that they had met their opposition. Uh, the fleet of mercenary coalition ships invited to patrol with Mortis Legion were waiting at Orville Stargate. Some of the Legionnaires, assuming that they were there to help, jumped into Orville, where they were proceeded to engage NORAD ships. The rest found themselves on the wrong side of mercenary coalition's guns. Shortly after this, the Bob fleet engaged the Legion fleet ships as well. This resulted in the loss of several Mordu Kaldari Navy Ravens. Quote, we are not the Legion's puppets, and we will not do their bidding, end quote. Eyeshadow, a member of the Sharks with Freaking Laser Beams, said, quote, We are loyal to our friends, but we, are expected but we expected more from Mordus, and their lack of any contact just, uh, just proves what they think of us, end quote. When asked if Mercenary Coalition was trying to supplant Mer Mordus Legion in the mercenary business, Eyeshadow replied, quote, We believe that we al are already the top mercenary force in the universe. We have proven we can fulfill any task and take on the biggest odds, end quote. <clears throat> Echoing Eyeshadow's dismissal of the Legion with Shrike, a leading figure in the Bob Alliance, quote, no one is allowed to enter our regions looking for targets, end quote. Shrike explained as he pursued the Legion throughout Syndicate, uh, through Syndicate, yeah. Quote, we hope these guys brought some guts with their fancy ships. After the initial patrol was destroyed or left PF TAC 346, a fast response team of Legion pilots was dispatched to PF TAC 346, though they quickly left. In this, is this the end of Legion patrols and syndicate? Preliminary reports suggest the answer to this be a negative. Ron withdrew some of the ships to the Federation Navy plant orbiting Orville 1, where they docked for repairs. Ron explained that this move to Orville was not to avoid the Bob or Mercenary Coalition fleets, we were after NORAD, he explained, over drinks at the lounge. They have proven themselves to be hostile, and we want to clear the area of hostiles. Even though we have withdrawn from our ore contract, we still have a vested interest in the region. When asked about the actions of the Mercenary Coalition and Bob, he declined to comment. However, it seems like yesterday's firefight has a silver lining. The Shiv Aja of NORAD talked to Lieutenant Ron and discussed the possibility of a ceasefire. According to Lieutenant Ron, their only demand is that NORAD issues an official apology for their actions during the Mol Mordu pullback. It seems like such an apology will be forthcoming. Hey, Lorelite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a faction carrier that they teased and then never added. <clears throat> All right. December 2nd. This week saw another soiree of Mortis Legion forces into Empire space. Just a few nights ago, a well-armed expeditionary force commanded by Lieutenant Amarlik Ron has entered into the system of Shenda and proceeded to systematically lock down all of the exits and stargates in the system. 
The aim of the Enterprise, according to the second-in-command, Lieutenant Kikui v uh, Viraki, was to, quote, contain forces of the Imperium Alliance and engage with the, them with extreme prejudice, end quote. Apparently, Mordu spies have kept a constant eye on Imperium pilots, and this was the best time to contain few high-ranking Imperium officials in one system. The strife between Mordu's Legion and Imperium began, with our as our readers with will recall, with after NORAD and Imperium vessels have attacked Mordu's convoys in C four SeaTac B7X, as well as the previous assault on Legion's interest in the Outer Ring system. As the fleet entered Shenda, Lieutenant Ron announced, quote, Mortis Legion is here for the pilots of, from the Imperium Alliance. We have not forgotten your actions in the past, and you will be shot down on sight, end quote. At this point, Legion's forces proceeded to systematically lock down the solar system. The pilots from VOTF, including their CEO, Mr. Zertamov, was effectively camped in within their stations. The tension rode significantly as some previously neutral pod pilots called to Imperium Vo uh, VOTF and Mr. Zertam Voif out uh, to come out and engage the Mordus. One of the pilots, MME, Saboteur of Blood Inquisition, uh, went as far as to actively engage the Legion and demanded that Imperium come to her aid. As Mordus Legions fr tried to track down the Saboteur's lone Rifter frigate, most of the Imperium contingent chose to remain within the confines of the station and avoid active conflict. Man, made you form, blue ball in, tale as old as time can you imagine a time where you got where you had to a, a, a real life player alliance got blue balled uh, blue balled npcs an npc faction uh force got blue balled by a bunch of pi pilots that didn't want to fight him that's funny uh after about 40 minutes to an hour of d dynamic scanning lieutenant ron rel relinquished the hostile intent towards mme saboteur and commanded his forces to withdraw Oh, you caught up to current time. Nice. Yeah, wow, Bob, now I know you're talking history. Uh, Ascendant Frontier, by the way, are the people who made the very first uh, Titan. And they are the ones that the... Um, one of the Fortizars are named after them, right? Or they named one of the Fort... What, what it, it was one of their stations that is one of the Fortizars, uh, the faction Fortizars. Anywho, uh... After Mortis Legion forces withdrew from the system and traffic was allowed to resume, I had the opportunity to talk to Mr. Zertam Voff and his, the benefit of his opinions on the situation, and had the benefit of his opinions on the situation. According to him, the tactical decision to not engage was due to the fact that vote VOTF was engaged in peaceful mining operations. Blah, 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 blah. It's very funny, but I don't think we learned anything new. Or, except for the fact that this was an intrusion into a 0.5 system. So they got camped in on a point in a high sex system by NPC rats. That's really funny. Imagine if they did that today. Uh, six days later, Serpentis forces clash in outer ring. Ships under the command of Serpentis admirals have been spotted patrolling the regions of Fountain, uh, outer ring and cloud ring recently, causing tensions to rise in the organizations inhabiting those areas. Yesterday, we saw a force of four Vindicator pa battleships and an Ishtar Spar with NORAD forces in the system of 4C-TAC B7X. NORAD forces alert to the presence of hostilities in 4C-TAC B7X quickly mounted a blockade of the situation. As Serpentis undocked, the NORAD patrol began to open fire on the ships, causing the Serpentis to retaliate. The resulting battle saw two NORAD ships, battleships go up in flame. Why does it have to do with the Mordu? Spentis Corporation, based in the Fountain region, still reaps tremendous profits from pharmaceutical sales and rumor booster marketing. V. Salvador Sarpati has made it enough profit by these sales to hire the Guardian Angels to protect his assets. Sarpati has been the target of recent investigations by both the DED and Mortis Legion, but it has evaded arrest so far. So, nah, not that relevant. Mortis Legion has strengthened its pure blind position. As part of their re relocation strategy, uh, this is, yeah, later December. Part of their relocation strategy, Mortis Legion has recalled its fifth dreadnought, Night Stalker's task force, to, le uh, to the Legion's headquarters in 5ZXX Tech K, putting the Night Stalker's command, Colonel Akuras, in charge of the whole Mortis Pure Blind fleet. The highly specialized strike unit was transferred to the Pure Blind Theater, quote, to strengthen the Legion's presence in our claim space, end quote, according to Mortis Command COO Jazobol uh, Ad Adrolkin, quote, 
Colonel Akuris, one of our most respected officers, uh, will be key to our strategy strategies in the region. Attican refused to confirm rumors that Colonel Akuris transfer was requested by Legion CEO Moria Mordus himself. Grim of the Mad, 070, thank you for that member of that producer membership. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Honestly, I'd love to see more NPCs camping player groups in high sec. I actually think that I was just thinking about this as we were, as I was reading it. What I'd like to see happen is I know that CCP has been doing like the live to life to feed stuff. And like, you know, CCP has been doing more like dev roams and just like getting out there and scrapping things up. I wish that they went back to doing this again, where they're doing basically that, but as like lore actors to make things happen. Right. That'd be cool. Um, I guess that's a good question for the day. Like, uh, would you be interested in uh, things like this kind of happening again? Where, uh, like, the thing I that I stick out of this is alliances are naturally. It seems, according to these descriptions, these these uh, alliances in the early days of Eve were naturally aligning themselves for or against NPC factions in a way that you don't really see nowadays. Like you have faction warfare, but even that, like a lot of people that play faction warfare still see it as like a way to make money or a mechanic. The NPCs are background noise, you know? Um, whereas, you know, I think it has something to do with the fact that because these were happening consistently, they give things to kind of wrap ourselves, wrap our head around. So in the same sort of way, in the modern day, I think that the closest thing that we have uh, for better or worse, is fraternity's association with the angels and their attacks on um, upwell um, convoys and such recently. Uh, but even that, I think, is just like a, a matter of situ circumstance. I just, yeah, I, I think it's kind of cool for it's like, oh yeah, you know, we're going to do a patrol of this region. Anybody who wants to come with us and do this roam with us um come do it right that's really i i think that that would be a cool thing to to do again but getting like npc actors to coordinate with alliances now the other question is is that like i could definitely see npc alliance or sorry uh null sec alliances cry foul if like being aligned with one of these factions is ever seen as any kind of advantage even if it's just access to certain materials or whatever um, so, eh, we'd have to see. Uh, player corp and NPC interaction is very nice, but CCP doesn't know what makes their game good. I think that a lot of things make their game good, right? And there are some things that make their game bad actively. And yeah. At any rate, uh, <clears throat> Say, uh, it's a great honor to serve under one of the Legion's foremost warriors, said the a visibly moved Captain Ron during his accepted speech. So he's apparently been re-promoted, right? He's back to being a captain. And this promotion is a reward to all of my men for our actions in Pure Blind and the Outer Ring. Say for Colonel Akur... And that's the thing, is that, like, based on player actions, Ron was demoted, and based on player actions and probably in a, in a certain way he, he was like redeemed or she i don't actually know him he say for colonel uh akuras and captain ron's speeches the ceremony was held under the strictest silence with respect to the recent loss of lieutenant ome hit hitimo whose clone failed to activate after his craft was destroyed quote as a man under my charge, said Captain Ron, I take my personal duty, it has my personal duty to avenge his departure from this world. He will not be forgotten. We shall not forgive, end quote. No comment was made as to the reason of Lieutenant Hidemo's clone failure, though the Legion has confirmed that this matter is being investigated and terrorism was not discarded as a possibility. After the ceremony, Colonel uh, Akuris ex accepted a round of questions from the reporters present at the event. Fo the following is the ex excerpts. Uh, you are accredited as one of the most dedicated, decorated officers in the Legion, are you not? The Legion has seen fit to reward my tenacity, or my tendency to find myself and my unit in the wrong place at the wrong time, yes. I've been awarded the Legion Gold Cluster with a bar, 
Legion's silver cluster with a bar, and the Mordu's purple heart. My own heart belongs to Legion, and having my faction's medal on my chest is my proudest achievement. You have been with the Legion for a better part of a century. What prompted you to join this faction? I... My family owes a lifetime of debt to the Legion. My father fought alongside Mordu during the Kald Galente Caldari War, where he gave his life fighting for our home a few years before the war came to a halt. I was an infant at the time, and the Legion took care of our family, as is tradition with fallen Legionnaires. I was blood and honor-bound to follow in my father's step. I a debt I have never regretted. The promotion of Lieutenant Ron, now Captain Ron, is a bit of a surprise after the Outer Ring incidents. It has been reported that he would be demoted. Could you expl expand on this issue? I am somewhat confused by the belittling of Captain Ron. His services are nothing but exceptional. Ships get lost during combat, but if you recall, the losses were light, and each time the operation was a success, even when heavily outnumbered. He has earned his promotion with and his new position, and it is an honor to have him in command of one of the Night Stalker wings. This is the first time that the Legion officially admits the Night Stalkers to be a Dreadnought Task Force. How many such vessels does the Legion have, and how many would be deployed in the Pure Blind Theater? Smiles. Enough and enough. Next question. The Legion has, on many occasions, flown with Razor Pilots patrolling Pure Blind. What is the purpose of some such combined squads? We patrol our systems, and from time to time, surrounding systems, to deal with various pirates and terrorist threats. Some freelance pilots believe that they can do whatever they want in our systems. We will convince them otherwise. What is Morty's general political position in Pure Blind, above all with Jericho Fraction, Razor's opponents in the region? Jericho Fraction conducts themselves with a don't shoot us, we won't shoot you policy that for the moment inspired. Wow. Can you imagine that? A, 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 an identified NPSI or uh, uh, NRDS organization in the wild? Policy for the moment, in spite of a few cases of ver verbal friction between pilots of JF and Mordu, they have not broken with us. We will soon learn how the interaction between our corporations develop. Suffice it to say that we have laws within our systems, and we are not. We will not tolerate piracy in them, and we will not allow terrorist attacks to be staged from them. Yet, among the few cases of verbal friction, JF CEO Jade Constantine has challenged Lieutenant Veraki to a duel after Lieutenant Veraki publicly insulted Ms. Constantine through FTL channels, FLT channels. Probably FTL. I understand that the posthumanist view of Mr. C I, that in the posthumanist views of Miss Constantine, a battleship and the lives of thousands of crew members is a small price to pay for a slight verbal insult. But I would rather sort things out in a nice, quiet manner for the sake of our neighbors, the Sisters of Eve, as we have somewhat of a good relationship with them as of late. About the Legion's previous actions, is, this, is the 4C Tech B7X incident with the Imperium Alliance over? Imp went way beyond verbal friction, attacking and destroying Legion vessels, lives, and property. It will not go unpunished, period. Imperiums can expect raids against them on a regular basis until full public apology is received. Mining operations, trade routes, star bases, even their recruitment offices are, as of now, valid targets for the Night Stalkers. It is my hope that we will not have to cripple them back to their rookie ships, but we will make an example of them unless we receive adequate satisfaction. This was back when they were called rookie ships, not corvettes. The foremost pod pilot mercenary organizations, the Mercenary Coalition, has recently declared on Galnet that Mortis Legion are a bunch of old timers. Any comments? Why, of course we are. Many of us were pod pilots while the likes of Miss Celine were still in Napies. Mordu himself was fighting back in the day before the pod, when a pilot went down with his ship. In fact, we hold ourselves to such old-timey mercenary codes as not blaming our clients for our failings. Ooh. Will we care to expand on your last comment? Never mind. Suffice to say, the Mercenary Coalition is a young, ambitious corporation with a, quite a few good pilots working hard to make a name for themselves in the big mercenary leagues. And young, ambitious blood is always good for our trade. We are, after all, professionals. Some recent communications with the Coalition could have been better handled by both sides. What must be clear is that the Legion does not give any spe special privileges to the Coalition. We have public channels frequented by many corps, uh, including those who are not on the best terms with the Legion, such as, for example, the Jericho Fraction. As long as people have a civil tongue, we are happy. And of course, the Coalition's pilots are welcome to contact our representatives at any time. After all, perhaps old-timers have a trick or two to teach, along with the occasional snippets of news about jobs going on. 
in general, where and working for who can we expect to see Mortis Legion flying in the near future? Our finished contract with Orr was a bit unusual in the mercenary business as it was both public and exclusive, preventing the Legion from seeking other clients. I cannot comment on our present contracts, but we'll make sure that the press knows when and if the Legion decides to announce such contracts in an official uh, fashion. Okay, and that brings us to YC-108. <clears throat> so two months later. This is 2006. Late Wednesday evening, a relief convoy compromise, er, comprised of heavy cargo vessels of the sis Servant Sisters of Eve en route to the Richard disaster. Hold on, actually. I forgot to look this up. Uh, a prime example of this is a failure to, of the Federation in responding to the Richard 5 disaster. In YC-108, Richard 5, a fairly small colony on the outskirts of Placid, was devastated by a supermassive explosion. Reports from the Sisters of Eve at the time suggested that nearly 90% of surface life, life was destroyed, a staggering amount of devastation that is nearly impossible to comprehend. Indeed, near, once relief convoys finally reached the system, only 2,000 survivors were found. It wasn't until much later, after a detailed analysis, that it was determined that the equilibrium of mankind... Oh yeah, got it. This is the Titan attack. Got it. So, late Wednesday evening, a relief convoy, blah, blah, blah. We, we read that. Uh, no, we didn't. Late Wednesday evening, a relief convoy comprised of the heavy cargo vessels of the Servant Sister of Eve en route to the Richard disaster was destroyed by a power surge after surviving an attack by iron. Earlier that evening, another freighter had technical difficulties which prevented it from joining the transport, according to the sisters. The an accident has claimed the lives of thousands of staff, the lives of life of one sister pilot, and leaves another sister unconscious. The freighter convoy, which departed from Toronos, was escorted by Sergeant Major Gian of S and Sergeant General of Mort and Sergeant Janelle Genel Genel of Gordis Legion, Mortis Legion, as well as assorted vessels from several corporations. Trouble struck the convoy when a fleet of Imperial Republic of the North Iron vessels engaged the convoy escorts as they es entered EC Tank P8R, a system well known for its frequent corporate battles and acts of piracy just beyond the patrol areas of the Directive Enforcement Department. A running battle ensues between the Iron Forces inexplicably intent on seizing the convoy's equipment or simply destroying it outright, and Morty's forces leading the escort. The fight con con continued for several systems before escorts were able to drive off the Iron Fleet, with the Mortis Legion pilots taking credit for the destruction of four hostile ships and the other escort pilots claiming numerous more. All remained quiet as the convoy traversed the last few systems in its route and dis and despite the deliverance, under the command of Sister Reisendorf, suffering from an unusual warp drive malfunction, the convoy and its escort safely arrived to the Richard system. However, as the freighters began to enter warp towards Richard 5, the scene of the planet-wide devastation was intended, an intended recipient of the vast aid efforts, the final disastrous event took place. Just as deliverance entered warp, Sergeant Major Gian detected a massive power surge within the cargo bay of the vessel. The Legion's vessel could do little but watch as the long-range scanners, with long-range scanners, as the deliverance exploded in mid-warp. The shock wave from the blast not only destroying the Angel, the second freighter commanded by the by Ippis Hungdang, and following closely in warp, but escape pods of both pilots as well. Sources within the Sisters of Eve have indicated that despite her cloning clone being activated, Sister Reisendorf remains in a coma in critical condition in the medical facilities. Ippis, however, was not so lucky. Interference from Warp Tunnel prevented the clone systems from functioning correctly, and as of such, the Sisters of Eve and the Glente Federation has listed him as deceased. Shortly after the destruction of the convoy, a spokesman for the Sisters of Eve stated, quote, We have not given, yet given up hope to the survivors of Richard 5 disaster, and we will attempt to provide as much assistance as we are able. However, the chances of finding and aiding survivors on the surface of the planet now grow fainter with every passing day. When questioned over both the overt and covert attacks on the convoy, the spokesman replied, We were, are horrified by these attacks on a peaceful humanitarian mission and disgusted that anyone could have considered such an act against both humanity and the sisters, a well-noted neutral party in the galactic affairs. 
The freighters were carrying medics, scientists, and other volunteers, as well as thousands of ISK worth of medical supplies. The losses in human lives lost uh, during the incident, uh, accident and the losses that will follow from the delay of supplies will be staggering. With the Iron Alliance facing widespread condemnation for what several Galente Federation senators have described as the most cruel and callous act of piracy seen in recent times, much attention has been diverted from the question of who sabotaged the freighters, of, uh, from, yeah, of just who sabotaged the freighters, a backup plan ex executed by Iron after the failure of their fleet, or a strike from an unseen or as yet unknown enemy? No matter who is responsible for this vile act, the Sisters of Eve, quote, vows that those behind the attacks on the Sisters of Eve will be made to pay. Five months later. Last week, patrol of fo forces, patrol forces of Mortus Legion vessels tasked with removing Garissa's elements from several systems in the Pure Blind region, suffered significant losses after being caught by an ambush as, as a yet unknown pirate fleet. The five ships patrol fleet embarked from its current base of operations at the Mortis Legion testing facilities in the 5Z XXTech-K system on a wide pattern patrol through several constellations of the Pure Blind region. The fleet, centered around the Caldari Navy Raven of Colonel Akuris, was reportedly on a mission to clear several Garissa's pirate infestations on the behest, behest of the Servant Sisters of Eve. Shortly after engaging and defeating a number of small Garissa's groups operating in the x 7 omu system, the fleet received orders to make an immediate return to base. The return voyage mimicked the largely uneventful outward trip until the patrolling entered into R6XN-TAC-9 system, where the Mortis Legion ships were immediately set upon by a large number of unidentified pirates. The initial engagement was swift and brutal, resulting in the destruction of three of the Mortis vessels and their pod pilots, including that of Colonel Akuris. The fleet's second-in-command, Major Koinahala Hala, piloting a second Kaldari Navy Raven along with Sergeant Major Gian in a vulture, managed to flee the carnage and make their way to the final stargate in the chain. However, both pilots were again set upon immediately after entering into the 5Z XX-TAC-K system by compatriots of the first raiding party, and at inexplicably evaded detection by Mordu's forces stationed in the system. The second brief engagement did not end well for Major Koinhalia, this time resulting in the destruction of his ship and pod. However, Sergeant Major Gian was able to evade pirate raiding fleet and make his way to the station safely. Mordu's Legion command spokespeople have refused to answer questions of the incident, instead releasing a statement, quote, the Legion has adjusted its standings towards the culprit accordingly. At this time, we will not be releasing the names of the pirates involved in this action. Inside sources have suggested that an embarrassed Mortis Legion command has made several key staff changes in its forces in the system, notably in the station sensors and reconnaissance departments. An unconfirmed rumor that Colonel Akuris remarked to medical staffs and observers that, quote, it took 12 of the bastards to take me out, has been strongly denied by the Legion, whose response to questioning regarding the rumor was, quote, we will not re be releasing the numbers of, class of classes of ships involved at, th at this present time, end quote. All pod pilots have been advised to steer clear of the area possible until such time as the Legion, or possibly even the Caldari Navy itself, has identified and dealt with this publicly unknown menace. Rescue ships finally reach disaster surface. Oh, yeah. Wait. Yeah. Wow. So this is like seven months later. Last Wednesday, a convoy of rescued ships finally landed on the surface of the planet of Rochard 5, seven months after the planet was reduced to an uninhabitable wreck as it, uh, by an yet, as of yet unexplained disaster. The convoy of rescue ships under the uh, aegis of si Servant Sisters were able, finally able to land on the surface of the planet during the first lull of planet-wide megastorms since the incident occurred. Despite the scale of the destruction, and the significant period of time in which the entire surface of the planet had been incapable of supporting life and almost completely devoid of infrastructure, the search and rescue parties received quite a shock. Amongst the ruins and caves dotting the surface uh, landscape, the teams found and rescued well over 2,000 survivors from the disaster. Suffering from malnutrition and disease, and with rumors of cannibalism filtering through the fleet, they were quickly evacuated to medical vessels in orbit before being moved to an undisclosed location where their physical and mental states can be assessed and treated. Representatives from the sisters quickly announced 
to the media that there were no evidence of cannibalism in any of the survivor sites and that search and survey missions of the planets will continue until it's no longer safe to do so to remain on the surface. In related news, investigators from Mortis Legion and Concord have confirmed that the disaster was not of natural origin. Releasing small sections of the compiled data to the public, the investigation teams announced that scans of the system shortly before an, uh, the event occurred indicated the presence of an Avatar-class vessel, an Amar Empire-designated ti uh, Titan in low orbit over the planet. This was further confirmed by scans conducted in the days after the event, which detected an energy signature on and around the planet consistent with the Doomsday device known as Judgment. According to experts, this weapon, normally used to annihilate, annihilate entire fleets, is quite capable of causing this level, the level of destruction seen across the entire planet of Rashard 5. This is back when doomsdays were AOE devices. This was where the good news from the investigators ended, as according to all available data, the Avatar immediately jumped out of the system after the weapon had been fired. However, due to simultaneous activation of over two dozen sinusoral fields across the galaxy, they were able to, unable to track the vessel's course. And beyond that, all contact with the vessel was lost. Though the investigation team has not announced any, any cessation to their activities regarding this incident, the fact that even the ship's identity cannot be determined from the small amount of existing data suggests that the galaxy fears will not be alleviated anytime soon. So, uh, again, that is so that this was uh, the equilibrium of mankind made this attack, and this is actually the same attack that. Uh, uh, Chakade use sorry the same Titan that Chakade uses in the um, Tanu attack, like a decade later. Serpentis appoints or administrator to Lord Admiral uh, Lord Admiral position. There you go. So, <clears throat> in a surprising change of policy, the Serpentis Corporation has appointed a former Outer Ring Excavation Station Administrator Fazin Oron as the position of Lord Admiral. He is now responsible for communication between Or and Serpentis and will assist with the decisions between the executive boards of both corporations and their combined strategic benefit. This appointment follows the Serpentis hostile takeover of Orr after Mortis Legion has departed the region, taking a majority of the defense fleet with them roughly five months ago. The takeover saw the murder of the previous station administrator in 4CTAC B7X, who is commonly believed to have deactivated the defense grid and allowed the Serpentis to stage a relatively bloodless takeover of the station, and subsequently all other Orr stations after orbiting, uh, obtaining the security override codes. So, very shady, very bad, but now Serpentis is in control of Orr. This is 2008. Or, yeah. Sorry, 2006. The Serpentis takeover was widely unpopular amongst Orr workers, and there were subsequently many strikes and resignations throughout Orr staff, with a large number leaving return, a uh, large number leaving, returning to the central systems to find other work. Despite these difficulties, Fazin Oron, Having been appointed station administrator after the murder of his predecessor, was able to start negotiations with Admiral B Brian, the head of the Serpentis fleet that had staged the takeover. Within three months, the negotiations between Fazin Oron and Admiral Brian, Brian had bought, brought the region under control, and in the last month, Orr has begun turning a profit, and its operations in our ring are growing again. Fazin Oron uh, is also a very popular figure within Orr due to his influence and profit-making strategies. His population, his popularity is also presumed to be the reason behind his sudden promotion into Serpentis. Lord Admiral Fazin Orun is being joined by Serpentis advisor Admiral Alaroth, who will be coordinating all static security forces within Outer Ring. Admiral Brian will uh, stay in command of the Serpentis ex expeditionary fleet, which will continue to operate within Outer Ring. Mortis Legion launches flagship vessel. This is... Guys, we've made it to 2007. Okay? April 14th, 2007. Uh, 5Z XXTAC-K. On Thursday, the 12th, at approximately 1100 hours, the first two plant of the planned flagships was launched of the Mordu HQ system. The vessel christened Honor will will be under the direct command of Colonel Akuris of the Mortis Legion Command. The exact specification of the ships remain unknown, although anonymous high-level sources have supported the more widespread rumors that the uh, vessel is a capital-class craft of some kind. The Legion itself has refrained from of officially commenting on the ship type at the moment, offering only the word flagship in, uh, in a, as a description. Given the long-standing history of the other Legion task forces utilizing dreadnought-class capitals, the current speculation is rife. 
Following the launch, there was a small private ceremony held in station where the Caldari Navy officially transferred control of the vessel over to Colonel Akuris of the Mordu's High Command. Colonel Akuris graciously ex accepted the transfer, uh, promising that honor would live up to its name and uphold the shared ideals of the Legion and the Caldari State. When asked in a brief in uh, interview about the tasks honor will be expected to undertake, the commander replied, quote, She is just the first step in a plan build up of forces to reinforce our position in pure blind region it takes more than one ship to secure a region this large however it will certainly be a considerably easy task easier task now uh commending uh, commentating on the plans for a possible second flagship vessel the commander was less forthcoming hinting that so far only a name existed quote as with most plans of this nature there's a large investment of time and other resources involved hopefully one day glory will fly next to her sister, allowing the Mortis Legion a greater range of tactical options that can be chose to employ in the future. Uh, Colonel Akuris himself has a long and distinguished history with the Legion and, has, uh, and was the expected candidate for command of the vessel and its support. The son of an officer who fought alongside Mordu during the Caldari Galente War, he has followed his, in his father's footsteps, earning the Legion's gold cluster with Bar, Legion's Purple Heart, and various other accolades. His loyalty to the Legion is almost renowned, almost as renowned as his success in establishing the Legion since its relocation, a mystery he was a, a mission he was personally tasked with overseeing. The Legion has slowly been consolidating their position in Pure Blind ever since the rearrangement of forces primarily in the area over a year ago, a move that followed the high profile end to their contract with Outer Ring Excavations. Since that time, they were they have launched squads of increasing capability and strength, such as the Night Stalkers. The fifth dreadnought task force dispatched since the re, uh, the fifth dreadnought task force dispatched since the repos repositioning. According to sources within Legion High Command, Honor will be undergoing tests runs at the Legion testing facilities in Pure Blind Region and is scheduled for tactical deployment within the next few weeks. Uh, Count of Kingdom stand. So this is this is where things start to pick up because we're like we don't get a lot of follow ups. I couldn't find a lot of stuff to fit in the gaps here so in 2008 so the uh, like over a year later conid kingdom stands down navy more to follow suit conid prime following the withdrawal of the oh this is literally so this is empyrean age right the elder uh the elder attack fleet um well yeah So this, what's happening here is the Elder Fleet, which is the combined forces of the Thucker tribe and uh, some stolen assets from the uh, Republic Navy. They went in, dismantled Concord. So you can see here, like, this is the Concord building. So they attack Concord in Uli, and then they proceed to attack into a Mars space, only to be stopped by Jamil uh, above... Mehator, not Mehator, uh, above Zeref, city of Zeref in uh, Sorum Prime. We will fight for what we believe in. We will take a side, and our wrath will be furious. Well, this 
dismantle Welcome the other fleet. They then continue to, the to shoot them. Empyrean age. Yeah, and this is actually where the term Empyrean comes from, because um, during the beginning of the events of the Empyrean age, um, oh God, what's his name? The Mimitar guy, the spokesman, um, starts with K. He's shown up more recently. Gosh, I can't remember his name, but he uh, he calls uh, the Capsuleers the Empyreans of our age who will guide us to the future. You know, uh, Empyreans is like a, an angel. You know, Empyrean is the highest heaven. Uh, no, not Malaku Shakur. The other guy is uh, the, the, the guy who always has banter with... Um, Every name has just fallen out of my brain. Like, everybody's name has fallen out of my name. No, Shakur's the blind guy. Oh, gosh. Hold on. Actually, hold on. Uh, I got an idea. I'll do you guys one better. So this is where the word comes from. <clears throat> uh, so this is a um, Genesis region, Sanctum constellation, the Uli system, Planet 9, Concord Bureau Station. Um, so this is just before what we the video that we just saw. Far from the armor forge of the Kaldari territories in the political junction of New, New Eden, the newly appointed Mimitar ambassador, Kaiten Yun, that's who it is, took a moment to review his notes before approaching the podium. The Concord Assembly, long a bastion of international diplomacy, blah, 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 blah. Behind the, each ambassador with thousands of seats. You get the idea. Um, session will now commence, announced the Concord session moderator. Ambassador Yun, you may begin your introductory address before we proceed with the day's agenda. Congratulations on your appointment. Rising to his feet amongst polite applause that came primarily from the Minotaur and Galantean sections of the audience, Kitan cleared his throat. <clears throat> Thank you, Your Honor. It is a privilege and a lifetime dream of mine to be speaking here, at the cornerstone of our civilization, and on behalf of my beloved Republic, to whom I owe my origins and my soul. All of the mem Assembly members nodded approval except for the Ambassador Saul. During my tenure as a professor, I found that the study of history compels a thorough examination of humanity itself. To gain an understanding of the past, we must first understand ourselves and the relationship we share with our fellow man. As an academic, I always emphasize parity in the, telling of our his, uh, in the telling of our history. As diplomats, we have a responsibility to our children to be objective when we record events as they take place today. Only then can we navigate through the challenges ahead and forge a better future for us all. Kitan paused for a mild burst of applause while the Amarian ambassador stifled a yawn. As the technology of our civilization advances, so do, does our responsibility to promote its application towards the advancement of peace. With the union of man and machine, we have taken our first small steps into the age of post-humanism, in which science has liberated mankind from the chains of mortality. The Capsuleers are the Empyreans of our age. They are our shepherds to the stars. And these times will undoubtedly be recorded as being amongst the most pivotal in the history of man. Those awesome responsibilities that come with these advancements have bought, brought with them great challenges. I am certain we will meet some of these with success, but my experience tells me that others, tragically, will remain unconquered, impending the impeding the progress of our humanity and sheltering us from great enlightenment. I say this because time and time again within these hollowed assembly grounds, our efforts to rise and conquer the fundamental challenges of universal equality and human rights have failed. The Concord moderator frowned and his colleague looked up impassively. I have always found it astonishing that we have the will and the means to achieve the seemingly impossible, like building titans or creating oceans on dead planets. And yet here, we cannot agree on the fundamental tenets of human decency. The silence in this hall right now as I speak these words tells me that the means are here, but it is the will 
that is lacking. I stand before you as the ambassador of an enslaved race, speaking to an audience within which the enslavers are listening, and, uh, and ask myself, how have we survived? We of New Eden, when the definition of humanity remains so elusive, so transparent to so many. A disapproving shout rang out from the Amarian section, followed closely by bellows of support from Galanty and a Mimitar stands. For years, I studied the history made within this assembly, and I am convinced that history will judge our generation by the achievements we have not made here. So many times, goodwill has been disguised for indifference. Men have stood on this very spot and insulted my republic with their empty promises, ignoring the pleas of ambassadors like myself, begging for them to see reason instead of selfishly running from it. Murmuring ran out, ran, uh, rang out from the Amarian contingency seated behind Ambassador Saul, who is now smirking. My nation holds a seat at this assembly, and yet the overlords who spit on our freedom are permitted to share this honor as well. Is there any greater insult than this? Here, they can legislate po policies for the alleged betterment of New Eden when the plight of billions cry out from within their own borders. Why is such blatant hypocrisy allowed to persist? What justification can we give as an assembly to allow our presence, allow in our presence a brutal empire that embraces slavery, peddles the women and children of my nation like cattle across its borders, drugs them into obedience, and then dares to appeal in this sacred hall under the pretense of diplomacy and goodwill? Ambassador Saul leapt out of his seat. I've, had en I've heard enough. I've not traveled all this way to be insulted by a novice. How dare you? Chiton, encouraged by this reception, obliged. And Galantine audience was on its feet. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah, that's it. That's the end of it. So, yeah, Kaidion, man of good words. I love that dude. He's cool. Yes, this is from the Empyrean Age. Hey, Sheesh. Okay. Moving right along. Where were we? It's Empyrean Age. Now then, uh, in what was that July, uh, July of um, the end of July in 2008, we get pilots are moving from Pure Blind in an attempt to join the famous Mercenary Legion. More than 100 have arrived in the 5Z XX Tac K in the last week after Legion's readiness to mobilize during the recent war has reignited interest in them. Seemingly disillusioned with the current political and military situation inside of the Caldari State, many ex Navy pilots are making the journey in an attempt to join Mortis Legion. Erle Hakilin, a former Navy Kestrel pilot, was one of the prospective recruits. He cites his personal reasons for attempting to join. Quote, I have trained all my life to defend the state, to defend the weight of the life of our citizens. I look forward to flying in the combat, but letting the militia do the work while we sit on our hands isn't my idea of fun. Hakilin continued, quote, The Legion has, is an opportunity to continue fighting and stay loyal with keeping... Uh, my self-respect. So remember, the Imperian Age events led to the Emergency War Powers Act of uh, Mil Emergency Militia War Powers Act of YC-110, which basically halted active hostilities between the four empires and established the militias as proxy fighters and thus faction warfare. One of the other potential recruits, uh, Ginsele Heverer, is trying to join for very different reasons. An Intaki by birth, the current fighting in Placid has made him look elsewhere for employment. Quote, I have never subscribed to the idea that people are an equal in this part of the feder equal part in the federation. The Galente seem quite content to fight a war by proxy on in our Antaki homeworlds. This is the best opportunity that we have had in living memory to make to change for our people. I'm hoping my skills will be enough for Mordu to accept me. Moria Mordu is a perfect role model for a free thinking Antaki. Although the Legion has traditionally supported the Kaldari state, it appears that they are quite content to sit back and allow the current troubles to develop before showing their hand. A source from inside their headquarters in 5Z to XXTAC K5 Moon 17, Mordu's Legion testing facilities, remarked, quote, Mordu and his lieutenants are continuing their daily meetings as usual. The only change I've noticed is a renewed fervor in the heightened security. I don't know what they're planning in there, 
But knowing the Legion, they're going to be sure that whatever happens, they've already planned for it in detail. Surprises are bad business, after all. Okay. We're wrapping up this time period, guys. Then we only got... And then we're done with the first time period, which is technically, you know, the, the longest one. So, whatever. Uh, eight months later? x tech 7 OMU, the Sisters of Eve, announced plans to launch an expedition into wormholes following Creodon's dis discovery of civilizations in that area's place. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, uh, the Apocrypha event happens. Uh, ten different devices simultaneously blow up. Hold on. caches of Isogen 10 was detonated simultaneously, causing a chain reaction in their local star, causing a giant burst of energy. And something about this event triggered the, form the creation of wormholes. Uh, randomized temporary topological point defects that lead between different areas of space, including previously unknown regions of space that is now known as J-space, sleeper space, or wormhole space, or, K or W space. Or Noikis. So, that happened. Uh, according to reports, the SOE, dis oh, sorry, the Servant Sisters of Eve discovered a wormhole in an unidentified system near their headquarters. Quote, if there is a civilization on the other side of these wormholes, then it is imperative that we approach with even more caution than before said uh, SSOE sp spokesperson. We do not know if these structures are inhabited or abandoned, nor do we know the disposition of the civilization that built them. The sisters are taking several top diplomats, linguists, and scientists in an effort to make peaceful contact with any possible inhabitants in wormhole space. In addition to scientific vessels, Mortis Legion escort ships will accompany the expedition in the event that the structures are inhabited by hostile entities. We are taking every effort to protect our people. We will go in with an open heart, but ready arms. The sisters expect to launch this expedition within a few days and will provide updates as they come. And finally, to wrap up this period, uh, the basically the Taki Assembly requests FDU's ceasefire. <clears throat> the uh, the Galente take the system of Intaki from the Kaldari in Faction Warfare which triggers in a brief press conference directed primarily at FDU, which is the Galente Faction Warfare Militia Corp and independent capsuleers. The attack in Taki Assembly today requested that all loyalist cap captains cease hostilities against the Shikone and Mortis Legion vessels in Intaki space. The Intaki spokesman stated that vessels belonging to the Shikone Corporation and Mortis Legion are present in Intaki at the specific and uncoerced request of the assembly, adding that any captains detaining or destroying such vessels are acting indirectly against the interests of the Intaki people, as determined by the assembly, and further are reviewed as committing acts of piracy. She did clarify that Ishikone Corporation is permitted to operate only civilian vessels in the system, and Ishikone Watch is explicitly excluded from entry under the terms of the agreement. Mortis Legion, however, has been afforded complete military access subject to command oversight with the civilian assembly. So this is when like tensions between uh, over and Taki kind of boil up. And this is where Mortis Legion kind of begins to step in as the security forces of Intaki. Uh, the federal Navy relief forces re uh, assigned to reestablish control of the Intaki system was denied access to the Intaki Stargate in a goes earlier today. Representative of the Intaki system command reportedly informed Admiral Gurnett who is command commanding the force, the Navy had no jurisdiction in, in Taki, and that their presence was neither required nor welcome. 
After the liberation of Intaki and other systems by the Federal Defense Union pilots last week, the Federation Navy rapidly mobilized units to systematically restore military command to the affected areas. However, Intaki leadership has rejected the protection that the Navy offered to provide, preferring instead to uh, rely on their newfound Kaldari associates. The future of Intaki has been subject of much speculation since the arrival of Ishikone and Mortis Legion vessels several months ago. While many citizens have assumed that the liberation of the system would see a return to the previous status quo, signatories of the federal charter retain the legal right to determine various aspects of the assembly of their original territories. This includes the shipping and security franchise, which regulates commercial shipping and which is traditionally assigned to FedMart and the Federal Navy and Customs. Sources within the Itaki Assembly assert that the deal with Ishikone and Mortis Legion was made in good faith and in the interests of the Intaki people. On condition of anonymity, a senior official said, quote, the Shikoni agreement represented and continues to represent the best option for the long-term safety and security of our society. Federal officials have refused to comment on what they describe as an internal Intaki matter. Okay. Now, let's go back a second. This to this, right? What is happening here? Well, actually, let, let me look up a different video real quick. Because the problem is, is that the Servant Sisters of Eve, Mordu, and Mordu were not the only people examining uh, wormhole space. Uh, Lydai famously sent in an expedition. Creodron showed interest. Um, but then there was this. A contingency of Amarians uh, being led and directed by the Empress herself, the Jam Jamil Sorum, who was corrupted by the entity known as the Other, uh, began ransacking sleeper facilities in order to develop a new breed of clone soldiers, Over here. which they named the Templars. This one seems to be intact. Okay, let's bring it in for analysis. The implant recovered by the extraction team has fascinating properties. An instant transfer of consciousness, even at the moment of death. So much blood has been spilled in the name of our faith. Too many have died at the hands of Imperians. Imagine the military application. But we have been blessed. I will unleash this new power and end the war. We cannot allow one nation to control it. They have done enough to leave their mark on history. Their soldiers would be dangerous beyond measure. The power they would have, they would be... Immortal. All right, so uh, basically, uh, this new breed of clone soldiers takes part, uh, you know, uh, takes off. The events of Templar One do largely contain uh, Moria Mordu. That's where this whole thing about not Imperial, that's Imperian Age. Uh, the whole thing about um, Mordu and he, oh, yeah, I closed that already. Mordu and his hat came from that. Uh, Mordu, like, I, I'm not going to go too deep into all of that right now, but um, you know, it's a pre he's he's a pretty fun character in that whole thing. But he kind of is operating as an independent agent at that time. So the Dust Soldiers are brought into the world, right? Um, the first breed of Colon Soldiers are um, are destroyed, but um, or you know, the the first breed of Clone Soldiers, the Templars which were corrupted by um, the other and the sleepers through their implants were kind of hunted down and further iterations of clone soldiers would then become the dust mercenaries that we know. 
Um, and of course, Mortis Legion uh, operates with them. And uh, eventually from this comes Arkhambine. Now then. We're going to jump to... Hold on. No. Yes. So we're going to jump to 2013 now. So we're we're making a kind of a big jump, um, but we're we're into Templar One now, or we're into you know Dust Five One Four stuff. Automa, a fleet of approximately ten Mortis Legion Rokes, along with a contingent of roughly twenty Capsuleers, landed drop ships on Automa Four in the middle of the war zone and extracted a large number of ground combatants apparently belonging to Osmond Surveillance Mercenary Corporation. The Osmond Mercenaries has apparently been def defending against the Kaldari Navy and Provost Assaults, aided by Mortis Legion. According to reports, both sides were supple supplemented by hundreds of independent mercenary forces in rolling battles which took place over several days. Reports indicate that fighting on the planets began several days ago and increased in intensity as more and more mercenary forces were called in by both sides in an attempt at a uh, to end the stalemate. The battle reached a high pitch at around... 1200 EST and continue until 1800 EST as both sides made a desperate final push to secure the battlefield. Rumors indicate that the, some of the mercenaries fighting on behalf of the Kaldari Provincial Directorate purposely allowed themselves to lose key objectives in that apparent sabotage of in solidarity with Osman's surveillance. By 1800 EST, the Kaldari forces have been pushed into a retreat and were unable to halt Morda's Legion from securing the area. Two hours later, with the ground secure and the majority of the surviving Osman surveillance soldiers gathered at a landing site. By the way, Osman surveillance is a NPC group. As, as with many mercenary corporations authorized to carry out planetary operations by the Kaldari executive panel, Osman surveillance began life as a personal army of one of the Graves families in the Kaldari state, the Osman. Owners of the Hacienda uh, Mega Corporation, now rumored to have gone rogue. But retaining Kaldari corporate status, the infiltration and black operations wing of the Osman family militia has turned into a ruthless mercenary corporation willing to take on any job from any client. We might want to trace these guys at some point. Uh, I know that these aren't listed in my Dust 514 corpse, but it is very possible that these guys were part of the evolution into Arkhambine, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, two hours later... Uh, with ground secure and the majority of surviving Osman survivors, um, the soldiers gathered at the landing site. Mortis Legion entered uh, Automa uncontested thanks to their good legal standings with the Kaldari state and then approached Automa 4 and deployed dropships while protected by a fleet of capsuleers. Within a span of roughly 15 minutes, the dropships had gathered the Mortis Legion and Osman surveillance personnel and returned to the Rea class freighter in orbit. They then departed, traveling unmolested to Sugerento, where the fleet docked in a Republic Security Services station. Reports indicate a few known Kaldar. Can you imagine getting a Rhea into Sugerento un unmolested? Anyway, reports indicate that a few known Kaldari loyalist capsuleers in the area who observed the action, though apparently either in too few numbers or simply unwilling to stop Mortis Legion. According to the sources, the Kaldari Navy apparently put out a call for assistance roughly 20 minutes before Mortis Legion arrived in space, indicating complications in battling the previously reported Grissus and Angel cartel incursions. Interesting. Angel and Grissus. Nowadays, anytime I see Angel and Grissus put together in the past, I'm get kind of curious. Rumors indicate widespread dissatisfaction amongst loyalist capsuleers with how the Kaldari Navy has handled and controlled military action, particularly the lack of communication and persistent rumors that the state is targeting its own citizens. As has been a common refrain, the Kaldari Navy has refused to comment besides refuting the uh, assertions it is targeting Kaldari citizens. Osman Surveillance has released a statement saying it is cooperating with the Kaldari Provisional Directorate on this issue and has no plans to follow the path of entire direct action and file a lawsuit. Entire direct action is one of those groups that we watch because of the deathless. But there is somebody else that hasn't really been talked about yet in this story that I do need to bring up, which he comes from Imperian Age, and I don't know how we've missed it, which is Tybus Heth. Tybus Heth, you know, the state, the Kaldari state is always supposed to be like these mega corporations that the tension between the mega corporations is what keeps the state in balance, right? That it's not a dictatorship. There's no one person in charge. There's just this council, and there is a chairman, but that's it. Well, um, when Tybus Heth like comes into the scene uh, with the help of um, the the broker, 
he's kind of moved into position to take over the Caldari state. And he forms what's called the Caldari Provincial Directorate, which is like, like, this is f like Caldari's full experiment with authoritarianism, basically. So, um, you know, and, and Tybus Heth was very ruthless and um, com like single minded. And it, this is what leads to Operation Highlander, which is kind of, the, uh, well, actually, um, no, actually, let's just say that during the events of, I think it's the Empyrean Age, right? So there was, um, there was an attack by Tybus Heth uh, that's known as the Second Caldari Galente War, where basically uh, Heth and his forces breach all the way into Luminaire, which is the heart of Galente. You know, it's it's where both the Galente and the Caldari come from. It's where the Galente home world and the Caldari home world are. Um, you know, the first Galente Caldari War, the Galente bombarded Caldari Prime, and that's what made them flee, which was basically them fleeing was the first Galente Caldari War, right? The second Galdari, Galente Caldari War was effectively a surprise attack by Tybus Heth and his provincial directorate, which attacks all the way into Luminaire, much like the Elder Fleet, but he's successful at securing Caldari Prime and putting a giant titan, the Shiamoru, over uh, over the planet to kind of protect it. So from that point on, the Galente territory effectively had one planet of Caldari control within the entire territory, which was Caldari Prime, which was being protected by the Shiamoru at the order of Tybus Heth. Now, Tybus Heth becomes a much more controversial figure as time goes on and eventually gets kind of ran out of the business, but Tybus Heth is a whole nother rabbit hole. But, yeah. Okay. Uh, reports indicate the fighting on the... Uh, where are where were we? Yeah, they were, we're done. That's what it is. Mortis Legion Angel Cartel joins Garistus in offering aid to Caldari targets. So this is, again, like this one stood out to me as being very odd because this is another one of the circumstances where we're seeing... You know, if you think about Mortis Legion as like a proxy for Arcumbine, we're starting to see the very moments that could be the things that they're referring to when they talk about the life giver and the various other stuff that they've been talking about in uh, the Vanguard stuff. So, um, you know, they talked about how the Angel Cartel and the Grisses have been working together since YC-115. Well, look, here we are. As the Caldari Navy and affiliated forces continue their operation within state space, several well-known pirate and mercenary organizations throughout New Eden has descended on the in the aftermath of battle, seemingly to offer aid and su succor to those involved. The Gris has notably raided a ground battle between Caldari Pro Providence Directorate and forces belonging to Antara Direct Action last week, making off with a number of combatants of indeterminate disposition. Afterward, Gris's representative, uh, Ominen Sin claimed, quote, those who were responsible to pull out are being cared for. Uh, sorry, who those who we we were able to pull out are being cared for and are receiving the correct medical support and assistance. She later went on to say in a separate statement that Garissus would be able to find some position for anyone with unique talents who might have cause to hate the state. And those who were the target of the statewide mili military assault seem to fit that description. While the claims of the Grisses were denied later by the Caldari Navy, more reputable organizations have also been spotted, though none has apparently yet inserted themselves into the middle of combat. Most notably, Mortis Legion, the renowned mercenary corporation, released a statement offering aid and shelter to any of the affected who wished it. The founders of the Legion knows what it means to be rejected and turned away by those you, uh, you thought shared loyalty to you, said Legion spokesman uh, Sunni Aina. There, there were war heroes but were forced to abandon, uh, abandon their homes. Mordu was there for those cast aside then, and it is here to welcome them with open arms now. We will assist any who ask. More surprisingly, the Angel Cartel, who traditionally operates from far from state space, has expressed their support for the targets of the Caldari offensive. Quote, the Caldar cartel and victims of Caldari oppression can be of mutual benefit, said Angel Cartel representative Kalia Autorold. With no confirmation, instances of cartel incursions have been made. Rumors abound of scout ships appearing around Caldari systems. 
as of yet. Qadari Navy has yet to make any public statements except for to denounce the accusations of the Garistas that the assaults were targeting civilians. The Navy continues to proclaim the need for operational security in denying requests for further information. So, tensions building up. The state is at, you know, the Heth is having difficulty keeping control of the state uh, at this point. And um, it's in its kind of weakest position that it's been since Heth took over. Um, and then this happens. Sure you're up for this? Attacking a sovereign Kaldari plan in the middle of Galente space. My people can get the job done, but it's gonna be tight. We're gonna need some help getting through. We're tracking significant movement of Kaldari forces towards the border zone. This could be our only chance to take back Kaldari Prime. You handle the Titan. We'll take care of the rest. Overwatch, we are moving forward on District 5. Please stand by in orbit. your engines. The blockade ends today. So we've talked about Operation Make Highlander. Long. Focus on your primaries. We'll make it through. I don't know where we've you got, got your intel from, but we're getting slaughtered down here. We need that strike. Somebody light up that HAP. I'm through. I'm through. Truly. Echo groups. Keep them off me as long as you can. Coordinates locked in. Heads down. Here it comes. Planetary defenses have been knocked down. The Leviathan is taking critical damage. Won't be long now. So, <clears throat> yeah, I, I realized that talking over it wasn't going to work. Sorry. Uh, is Heth still alive? As far as we know, he was killed by Blood Raiders. That's the, that's the current theory, but his body was never found. Only his pocket watch. Um, so this is the remains of the Shigemoru. Uh, which crashed on Kaldari Prime in, near the Kalakiota Mountains, kind of near our Kuril Prime. Fed Navy releases Kaldari Prime details. Citizens react. The Federation Navy statement detailing Operation Highlander, the code name for the offensive on Kaldari Prime that ended with the destruction of the Shigeru, uh, was the state. Uh, the statement declared an, the operation an overall success, while noting that certain details did not go as planned. In particular, the Federation Navy expressed dismay at the crashing of the Sh Shigeru into Kaldari Prime and the damage it caused. Though it noted that a much larger disaster was prevented by the destruction of the ship's engines while it was still in orbit. Additionally, the release put into question the belief that the Federation had overall supremacy, which would have enabled its ground forces to oust the Kaldari defensive planet side. Quote, despite orbital superiority, the Kaldari forces remained on the planet and had control of enough orbital defenses to make supply drops unfeasible. It is believed that any offensive to secure these defense batteries would have been too costly to attempt. 
So it's worth noting, this is actually a live event that really did happen. Uh, we've covered Operation Highlander a lot in other videos, but basically this was a simultaneous event that occurred in Dust 514 and in EVE Online at the same time where we fought over the fate of the Shigeru. And basically that last scene, like when, when the, when it was out, like the second that it was blown up, they brought the servers down. And then when they brought it back up, like, a, uh, like a minute later, this was the new, this was the change to the map was that they added the Shigeru in the background. Uh, the statement went on to say that the Navy fully agreed with the sentence. And the reason why they're saying this, uh, like kind of the lack of control was that, you know, it is, uh, this is actually one of the events that got criticized a lot because it was very clear that the players that were supporting the Galente were not beating the players that were supporting the Caldari, but the Navy was superior. And therefore basically the event was going to go the way it did, no matter what happened, but it was still a really fun thing to take part in. The statement went on to say that the Navy fully agreed with the Senate's decision to turn Caldari Prime into a demilitarized zone and was already pulling out its forces. Quote, despite the destruction and chaos on the ground, the Federation Navy understands that leaving its own armed forces on the ground would only cause needless tension, which might reignite fighting. This is why we, along with the Caldari ground forces, are withdrawing and turning over security of the planet to Mortis Legion. The knowledge that Mortis Legion is taking over security for the planet has not previously been released by any party. The representatives for the state and Mortis Legion has all independently confirmed this truth. Citizens across the Federation have been heavily positive about the press release and knowledge it contained. We had to get rid of that Titan, said a citizen of Galente Prime. They were holding people on Caldari Prime hostage. And imagine what would have happened if they had decided to warp it over to Galente Prime. I can sleep more soundly at night with it gone. Another said, it's sad that so many people had to die, but it is what it is. The good thing is that we can limit, to, limit it to only necessary deaths. If we kept fighting for the planet... More and more people would be killed. And if the Navy is right, and the Federation might not have even taken it, well, it was the Caldari's planet in the first place. They deserve to live there in peace, just as much as anybody else. Final details of Caldari Prime DMZ announced. Luminaire will be divided into a number of districts that shall be split between Galente and Caldari administration, while Mortis Legion will provide security for the planet. After final negotiations, roughly 54% of the districts will fall under the Caldari jurisdiction of, of the Ishikone Corporation, while 46% of the Galente District's administration by material acquisitions. The districts are purely administrative and should not be se segregated. They shall not be segregated by ethnicity. The treaty has been signed into law by, by the Senate, President Jacobs Rodin, and the Chief Executive Panel. Inhabitants of the Galente Districts will be considered full citizens of the Federation and fall under all laws that previously applied to Caldari Prime prior to the Caldari invasion. The Caldari districts are under a more convoluted system, with the individuals re retaining corporate citizenship with their current mega corporation employers, though Ishikone will collect administrative taxes and apply the, their corporate law for civilian activities. According to the terms of the treaty, Cor Caldari Prime's two largest cities, Arcurio and Toville, shall be split between two sides. Toville will fall under Caldari administration, while Arcurio has been placed within a, a Galente district. Mortis Legion will be... <coughs> Mortis Legion shall be solely responsible for the defenses and policing of the planet, with neither the Galente nor Caldari armed forces of any corporate police forces having jurisdiction. Mortis Legion will be paid from the joint fund provided by the Federation government and the chief executive panel, with each side providing an equal share to prevent the potential for bias. Vessels belonging to Mortis Legion have already been spotted transporting troops, police, and supplies in preparation for a long-term stay. In a joint statement released by both Federation State, the agreement was called... was. Uh, called a compromise that provides the best path towards the preservation of the Caldari Prime and the fairest resolution that could be reached. Ishikone has reported that its relief efforts are going well and that received continued support from other megacorps such as Sukavesta, which diverted a shipment originally planned for the Navy to the relief effort. The majority of remaining combatants has been evacuated from the surface with a few remaining to be removed by the end of the week. Power has been restored to two-thirds of those who have lost it, with estimates that the rest will be back to operational status within two days. Uh, Nuega Huvi visits Caldari Prime, reports uh, significant process of progress. Uh, representatives of Nuega Huvi Corporation, on behalf of the CEP, visited Caldari Prime over the past week to compile a report on 
uh, Ishikone Corporation's progress on restoring the planet. According to their initial reports, Ishikone is showing stellar prog progress in securing Kaldari interests on Kaldari Prime. Following weeks of heavy fighting, including a clash of the Leviathan, the crash of the Leviathan-class Titan Shiguru, Kaldari Prime has been heavily damaged with services cut off to many inhabitants. According to NOH report, the vast majority of these services have been restored in the newly formed Kaldari districts, with only a insignificantly small number of individuals going without. Additionally, repairs on the damaged infrastructure are progressing rapidly. While it will take years to fully restore all damaged infrastructure to peak condition, Ishikone is already ahead of schedule. Kaldari citizens who have migrated out of the newly minted Galente districts have reportedly general uh, happiness with Ishikone's oversight, despite many being citizens of other megacorps. Additionally, a fair number of ethnic Galente who have been long-term residents of the now Kaldari districts have chosen to remain, citing an unwillingness to uproot and confidence in Ishikone's ability to govern fairly. Ivis Heth <coughs> released a statement in response to the report attacking its accuracy. Quote, Given the details of the investigation, it is impossible to take the report seriously. The NOH representatives were get constantly shadowed by members of Ishikone Watch, ostensibly for their protection, despite the so-called treaty which assigns policies uh, uh, policing duties of Kaldari Prime to Mortis Legion. Following the traditions, uh, traitorous tradition of Ortro Goryushi, Ishigone used deceit to advantage their own aims. Already we see them bow bowing to the Glente, appeasing them, and allowing them to infringe on Kaldari land and rights. How long will it be before Ishigone gives to their Glente masters and usurps the planet completely? Uh, I will be launching my own investigation of the planet with my own loyal men and women acting completely independently of any Ishikone oversight. I anticipate we will be hearing much different story from them. Noagahuvi responded to the statement insisting on the accuracy of its report. Quote, we place full faith that the ability of our auditors to remain unbiased with corporate history of Ishikone is well documented and we have no reason to cover up for them. The Ishikone watch security assigned us assigned to us was never once attempted to prevent the auditors from doing their duties. In truth, the Ishikone watch presence was wholly superfluous as our auditors never felt the slightest bit of danger. So the important thing to note here is that um, Tybus Heth came from the Kalakiota Corporation and his biggest rival was Ishikone. Or Chiguriushi was one of the people that was really holding back his rise to power. So, um, yeah. That was orbital superiority not actually being a silver bullet strategy. Well, fair enough. Uh, <clears throat> all right. Then. A month later. Mortis Legion has announced that it has gained full operational over oversight of Kaldari Prime. The last of its combatants remaining planet side has been safely evacuated. The Mercenary Corporation has already begun its efforts with the mo more highly populated areas of the planet that are primed for beginning offering full services to the planet. As part of the treaty signed between the Galente Federation and the Kaldari State. I just had to check the time, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> Mortis Legion is responsible for the military protection of Kaldari Prime, including enforcing the established districts and preventing unlawful border crossing and smuggling. The Legion will also work with po local police forces to preserve jurisdiction rights and prevent disputes between districts. In a statement with, from Moria Mordu, the Legion promised to work closely with its partners to ensure transparency. Ishikone and material acquisitions will remain in firm control of the Kaldari and Galente districts, respectively. We will provide regular full reports to both of them. The Chief Executive Panel and Galente Senate in... Oh, in, oh sorry. We'll report, we'll, full reports to both of them to both them, the chief executive panel, and the Glente Senate in order to preserve transparency and ensure we are providing fair and neutral oversight of the planet. According to re reports, all involved parties are pleased with the progress Mortis Legion has made and are sure, confident they will continue to maintain p the peace on the planet. Wreckage of Shiguru to be examined by Ishikone and Zanu. The chief executive panel and Kaldari Navy have announced that, as part of their continued investigation in the events surrounding the invasion of Kaldari Prime, Ishikone Corporation and subsidiary Zanu, Zanu Biotech will retrieve, uh, will retrieve and investigate the wreckage of the Shigoru. Uh, Shigoru? Probably Shigoru. It's probably Shigoru. Either way. The largest piece of the wreckage, 700 kilometers outside of Okuro, 
has been mostly untouched since the forward section crashed into the planet following the destruction in orbit. Experts say that the wreckage remains unstable as the tit titanium alloy, which makes up its superstructure, continually reacts, relax, reacts with the oxygen atmosphere and loses stability, pulling any attempts at putting any attempts at cleanup for years, if not decades, down the line. Yeah, it's worth noting that like titanium actually reacts very aggressively with oxygen. They cut it with um, other materials to make, um, like, effectively like titanium steel, but it still isn't great in atmosphere, especially if it's like the protections are are destroyed, uh, like when the ship breaks in half. The CEP, however, stated telemetry data from the flight record is a vital part of our ongoing investigation into the effect events of March 22nd. It must be recovered in order to proceed. The Shikone and Zenu engineers will work under the oversight of Mortis Legion to recover and record the recorder, along with other components from the wreck, which may prove useful. Ishikone has stated it will exercise extreme caution in approaching the wreck as, quote, any un unnecessary disturbance could cause the power core or the doomsday device to explode. And then we're looking six months later. Several clashes occurred between the borders between Galente and Caldari held districts of Caldari Prime over the weekend, but were swiftly dealt with by Mortis Legion. According to reports, the clashes were sparked by the revelation that the Federation government has been spying on Caldari corporations. Well, raw aluminum responds to water right raw, raw lumen doesn't respond to oxygen does it like violently but yeah right sure yes magnesium i know is can be bad uh the disturbances seem to have originated with with exchanges of insults between caldari and galente escalated from there individuals or small groups swelled into small mobs on both sides it remains uncertain which initiated the violence but both sides are reported to have engaged in crossing borders to attack members of the opposite side mortis legion the neutral police force agreed upon by the caldari and galente government stepped in on each occasion to put a halt to the violence shortly after it began the legion deployed non-lethal riot suppression weaponry to disperse the crowds and arrested several individuals in connection with the violence According to official reports, all injuries have been minor, including a broken wrist of a Manar man who has uh, resisted arrest and a severe woman who broke her hand, striking a Mortis Legion officer in a drop suit. Administrative officials for the district were quick to praise Mortis Legion for their handling of the situation, stating this has been this had the potential to grow much larger, but the professional and even handed intervention of Mortis Legion seems to have averted that. Uh. Oh, shoot, this is way out of timing. This is from the beginning of the year. This is more... Um... Yeah, so this is just them responding to... Um... The clone soldier large shale ground fighting once restricted and mainly limited to engagements in contested territories has recently spread out from its former battlegrounds into new areas of engagement additionally while such ground battles were typically limited in scope fighting across new eden has bloomed into a larger scale engagements as swarms of new highly trained and uh, heavily equipped soldiers are filling battlefields so this is dust 514 public knowledge of these engagements have been uh, increasingly increasing since early last week when combat erupted on several planets across the contested territories of the Imperian War. Many of the soldiers attained access to public communication channels and had begun interacting with the cluster at wide, spreading stories of their exploits. The sudden emergence has captured the attention of New Eden at large, with rumors tinged with awe, suspicion, and fear spreading like wildfire. Son Lan, a military analysis, uh, analyst for The Scope, expressed common opinion on the soldiers. Quote, we do not know much about them, where they came from, what they are doing, or why all four empires seem to have begun utilizing them at roughly the same time, he explained. But what we do know is that they are highly trained, extremely well equipped, and have almost a suicidal willingness to plunge into battle. Because of the extremely high casualty rates involved in ground combat, infantry battles in recent years have been main mainly been limited to tactical engagements. With these new soldiers, however, they have become far more bloody. Bodies everywhere, claimed a member of the Caldari Marines who wished to remain anonymous. They, run, 
they run in like there's nothing to lose. And the scariest part is, I swear I see dozens of them get blown to pieces, but their never, numbers never go down. The Marines echoed the most disturbing and difficult to verify rumor yet made about these new soldiers, that they are capable of cloning themselves. Long the domain of the ultra-wealthy and the Capsuleers, the potential spread to, of cloning to individuals has broad implications for the cl cluster. The actual extent of the ability to clone, indeed, its very f faculty is difficult to ascertain. Contacts in all four militaries have refused to comment on the matter. Most refrain from even acknowledging the existence of these new troopers entirely, though the official statement from the Amar Empire affirmed their assistance. It read in part, quote, The Empire's paladins have always been the greatest strength. Under the direction of Empress, Empress Jamil I, we have forged our special forces, a new special forces who are unmatched in New Eden. With them, we will bring destruction on all who stand against God's righteousness. Sources have indicated that ground troops outside the four empires have taken notice of the soldiers as well, though none were willing to speak in except in general terms. The response of Mortis Legion was indicative of many when a spokesman claimed, quote, the Legion is always looking for new military technology and resources. The potential of these new soldiers for mercenary work is not being overlooked. So Mordu showed very keen interest on the clone soldiers uh, very early on. <clears throat> However, we must jump back forward in time a full year uh, from when the last thing was read. And uh, three months, four months after the previous thing, Ishikoni meets with Galente Senate on Caldari Prime. Media outlets across uh, the state were thrown into a frenzy of activity this morning after it was revealed that Ishikoni Corporation Administrative Director on Caldari Prime has initiated private talks with Galente Senate. Originally reported by the chief Caldari Prime correspondent for Nogahuvi, the re re revelation came after a convoy of Ishikoni branded transports arrived in central Arcurio this morning, flanked by an armed escort of Mortis Legion's 31st Armored Division vehicle. The convoy reportedly made its way into downtown Arcurio before heading for the Federal Assembly Complex, where they were granted access beyond its heavily guarded perimeter. Since footage of the convoy was released across the state to Nogahuvi midday news broadcast, reaction has ranged from muted disapproval to visible outrage from various organizations within the state over Ishikone's increasingly close cooperation with the federal government. A number of sources within the state has indicated that both Lidai and Kalakiota has approached the chief executive panel with concerns related to Ishikone's continued distancing from the rest of the Big Eight, uh, their relations with the federal government, and their monopolistic hold on Kaldari operations on Kaldari Prime. While many major corporations have remained reserved in their responses to the news, Kalakiota Press Office conveyed the corporation's disappointment over Ishikone's lack of communication with the chief executive panel since taking over administration, uh, administrative responsibilities of the Kaldari-controlled areas on Kaldari Prime. With news of further progress on Kaldari Prime and rumors ab abound that Ishikone CEO Mens Repala may be en route to Kaldari Prime to attain talks in person. Ishikone stock prices continue a slow but steady recovery towards their value before YC-110 attacks on Malkalin. Malkalin. Uh, the Malkalin disaster was the um, Nix flying into the station. Uh, <clears throat> five months later. 5ZXX Tech X Pure Blind. Mordus Legion Command has completed its issue of decoration today, honoring pilots who were involved in the op orbital battle above Caldari Prime on March 22nd, YC-115. The battle, which was triggered by Operation Highlander, the Federation Navy's assault against the Caldari Navy's Leviathan Class CN, uh, Class Titan CN Shiguru, Shiguru, yeah, brought an end to the five-year siege of Caldari Prime, the historical capital of the Caldari State and homeworld of the Caldari people. In a statement released by Moria Mordu this afternoon, the decoration was noted as, quote, a tribute to the actions of independent capsuleers and the notable sacrifice of countless crew in service of both Galente Federation and Caldari State, which was made to ensure that the turbulent situation of the planet was brought to an end. Mordu concluded that the statement by expressing his personal gratitude to the recipients of the decoration. This is actually a real medal, by the way, in game. Uh, titled Moria's Wings for the Heroic Efforts in Bringing the Conflict to, uh, on Caldari Prime, which is now recognized across the cluster as demilitarized zone under joint Caldari-Galente administration to an end. Following the statement, 
Tuna Aina, Strike Commander for Mortis Legion Command, responded to questions related to both the timing of the Decorations Award by revealing that, quote, the issue of this ribbon has been in dispute with the Directive Enforcement Department for over a year. After a number of Navy personnel involved with the conflict regarded the decoration of Capsuleers and their actions during Operation Highlander to be in poor taste. She continued by expressing the opinion that Mortis Legion Command believes that intervention by independent Capsuleers provided the required firepower to bring the situation to a swift resolution and prevented millions of deaths that would have been brought about by more prolonged conflict and surface counter-invasion by the Kaldari Armed Forces. Strike Commander Aina also confirmed that the decoration was issued to a total of 3,841 Capsuleers, all of whom were registered with the Directive Enforcement Department as having been involved in the engagement in low, or, low orbit of Kaldari Prime. Now I gotta check to see if I have that medal. I don't even remember. Hold on. Uh, medals? Medals. Ranks? Medals. Medals? Why is medals not loading? That's weird. Wait, why isn't medals loading? Yeah, there we go. Because I have a lot of them. Uh, I don't think so. Nope. I have the Wings of Valor. So uh, leave a comment down below if you have uh, the Mortis Ribbon and what you think. Ishikone, okay, so then this is August 21st. God damn it. Some of this got out of order. One month prior to that, um, the chief executives of Ishikone Material Acquisitions placed their signatures on an agreement that concluded the formal handover of the city of Arcturo Ar to the Caldari administration this afternoon. The ceremony occurred in front of Operation Highlander Memorial in District 24, um, <clears throat> and the city was greeted with a roaring cheer of employees of both corporations as Men's Repla and Entre Ilberi shared a handshake after the official handover of the city. The agreement specified that the city, which was regarded as a historical and cultural capital of the Caldari State, is now formally placed under Ishikone administration with Mortis Legion Command, continuing to provide global security and policing for the planet. So, you know, Arcuro was originally being controlled by uh, material acquisition, but it was decided that that district needed to be by the Caldari, so it was handed over. Cool. Uh, in a press conference uh, of the ceremony, Entre Ilgeri expresses satisfaction with the smoothness of the transition, hailing Ishikone's, quote, openness, professionalism, and diligence in ensuring that the correct criteria for handover was met. <clears throat> Similarly, a newly appointed commanding officer for Mortis Legion Command's presence on the planet, Strike Commander Tsuni uh, Aina, both, appraised both corporations on their incredibly professional approach to an extremely sensitive and important matter. While the small-scale unrest in several of our curios outlying districts had been reported by several by local news agencies, there have been no reports of injury or property damage, and Mortis Legion's security forces have been quick to quell any disturbances in the wake of the handover. Uh, God, this is actually way out of order. There's a lot of things that are out of order now. Wait, was it? Hold on. No, this is the one we got. We already read that one. Body of a disgraced Caldari Navy officer found on Caldari Prime. Wait, god damn it, this is in the past too. Sorry, a couple of these things got out of order. Um, Mortis Legion Command confirmed afternoon that the body of a former Caldari Navy officer, Sami Okuda, has been found in Cairola Park, Central Troville, in Caldari Prime. Public relations officer for the Independent Mercenary Contract Corporation was just drafted to provide security for the contested planet. After the, it was declared a DMZ on April, for, uh, April of YC-115, stated that Mr. Akuda was found approximately 1,300 hours in this afternoon, seated in a public rest area behind Lake Asara in uh, Carola Park. This was a beauty spot often frequented by tourists and local residents, and there was no evidence of foul play. His death is not being treated as suspicious, and the delay in any announcements is due to our insistence on first making contact with Ms. Mr. Okuda's family, given the sensitive nature of the matter. 
Several witnesses have reported to the press that the 58 6 year old Akuda, a former Navy veteran with 20 year service record, was seen in the park earlier the day and was found alone in a sitting area at the water slide in full military dress with a small flask at his side. When conducted, when contacted at their home in New Caldari Prime, the Akuda family declined to comment regarding events prior to the discovery. However, when approached while on deployment for the Lidai Protection Service in Noni Lone Trek, Akuda's eldest son appeared to brush off questions, stating that my father died in service to the state during the battle in Luminaire last March. The man you speak of obviously did what he felt was appropriate to preserve the honor of his family name. The Caldari Navy declined to comment upon request for a response to the discovery. What happened here? Well, uh, there is a tradition within the Caldari. Can I just look him? Hold on. At risk of compounding this even further, let's search for Akuda. Uh, like this. So this is a whole different thread. Let me let me point out to you, um, that that is being related here. But the key is. Hold on. The tea maker ceremony. The tea maker ceremony is a method of resolving disputes or more likely allowing for honorable suicide of the weaker party in a dispute amongst the Kaldari. In the ceremony, one party uh, to the disputed uh, dispute forces the other party to drink poison tea with the reasoning that the other party survives. They will have received divine favor. So that's probably what they're alluding to, especially with the empty flask. Hey, Richard. And then federal government announces handover of Arturo. We already covered that. Onward to the next thing. So that's basically the, the beginning and end of, of, of Operation Highlander, right? Um, you know, the dust mercs come in, you know, they build up. Tension comes, the Galente do Operation Highlander. It causes massive damage to Caldari Prime. Mordu steps in as kind of the neutral party as it becomes declared a DMZ. There's lots of political machinations, but or you know, like negotiations, but it, it gets divided up between the Caldari and the Galente, with Mordu being given like full like security rights of Caldari Prime. And uh eventually the system are uh, the the city of Arcurio, which is one of the more important cities on the planet, it's moved from uh, the Galente to the Caldari. Cool. Next. So, hey, no, th thank you. Now then, we we have we have to hurry up if we if I want to get done in the next half an hour before my son gets home. But let's see what we can do. Okay. So. Things are kind of quiet for a little while. Things are kind of quiet for a little while. Until we get the formation of Upwell. Upwell, oh shit, hold on. All right. Uli, a group of leading interstellar cor corporations comprising of Chemotech, Eifer & Co., Intaki Bank, Mortis Legion, Hitri, and Zors and & Son, have announced today the special filing with the Secure Commerce Commission to establish a major space industrial concern named Upwell Consortium. In their release, the founding of members of Upwell Consortium named Yanni Sar Arteu, Noted industrialist and former owner of the Ore Corporation as the chairman of the Upwell board. The Upwell Consortium is being founded 
as a means to capitalize on the burgeoning capsular space infrastructure market with initial product offering to focus on space stations and novel construction of several size ratings so as to suit the needs of the capsular organizations with varying scale and scope of operations. Upwell structures. The formal grouping of normal uh, of a number of corporations from across New Eden in a multinational interstellar consortium of this nature has not been seen on this scale since the ill-fated Creolair project. Upwell public relations point out that the Creolair project laboratories were a government-controlled organization and therefore subject to diplomatic pressures that the private partnership operating Upwell will avoid. Questioning as to the involvement of the Intaki Bank in Mortis Legion, Upwell were upbeat and emphasized, quote, the enormous confidence that the undertaking expressed by the direct partnership with one of the New Eden's leading banks, combined with the tremendous operational security that is the hallmark of the Mortis Legion, end quote. Galente business commentator Valley, Valentin Ortiz of the Luminaire Stock Watch Galnet site says, We've seen some upward pressure on the stocks of those corporations that are listed in the Federal Federation Stock Exchange, but are not seeing a stellar climb. My own feeling is that there are some surprises and cautions owning, owing to the players actually involved with the Upwell Consortium. For their part, <clears throat> Upwell Consortium spokespeople are saying that the grouping is in negotiations with a number of potential partners and that Upwell is aiming at nothing less than dominion of the capsular infrastructure market. So that's all fine and good. What we have here is the reemergence of the former uh, owner of Up of Ore. So this is the guy who became fabulously wealthy by building Ore up, right? This is the guy who handed it over to his buddy, which is where we began this entire story. And here he comes, and he's put in charge of this new organization that has the military wing of the Mortis Legion, which is the very group that he worked with back when he was running Ore. Right. So now Mortis Legion has kind of turned away from or that's being run by now the Serpentis and towards and, uh, you know, clearly friends with and now it, it intricately bound back to Yanni, which leads to. Mortis Legion and our Mortis Legion and our combined forces have launched simultaneous attacks on key Serpentis-controlled ore stations across the Outer Ring region. The assaults appear to have captured all stations in swift, surgical, executed operations, with most of the fighting already winding down. The same tactic was applied during all of the captures. Mordus used their fast ships to warp in and immediately throw out warp disruption fields to prevent any escapes. The importance that Mordu ships seem to have placed on destroying all ships attempting to escape somewhat contradicts the statement released by the Upwell Consortium today, stating that the main objective of the operation was to return the control of the stations and Or itself to the rightful owner and founder of Or, Yanni Sar Arteo. Once the space had been secured, shuttles carrying our combined mercenary forces warped in and entered the stations. In most cases, the station personnel surrendered without a fight. It is expected that Orr will announce it is joining the Upwell Consortium as a full partner later today. This is Lena Amber reporting for The Scope. So let's go back to Punch's question. Punch, are you still here? If you're still, I hope you're still here. So here you go. This is why Mordu and and or are still working together now because Yanni took back or for himself through uh, Upwell and reunited uh, those two organizations. So there you go. That's why Mordu and or still work together, even though they fell apart back in 2008. So uh, Liner says, I have the Murray's Wing medal. Apart from this, have they given out any other medals for lore or player content? Yes. They've given out medals for Faction Warfare Warzone Control. They've given out medals for uh, the various trivia contests um, uh, and a lot of other contests, too, especially recently, like uh, returning ore um, uh, scientists and other kind of participation in other events. Every once in a while, they'll they'll give a medal to everybody that was there. Let me see if I can find any others. Because um, let's see. 
I think that the, uh, yeah, so I think the two I have, no. So I have the Kali Medallion of General Studies, which was awarded to me by the Kali, University of Kali. That was for, I think, the uh, the trivia challenge. Um, the Federal Ribbon of Democratic Communication, I think, was for a different uh, trivia challenge. Um, and then these are all player ones. And then Wings of Valor. This was the one for taking the entire war zone. And then apparently I got one more. No, that's that's player one. Oh, oh, nope. I got this one. Distinguished Stargate Trailblazer Award which I got for participating in Stargate Trailblazer. So, yeah. All right. Yeah, well, I mean, they've gotten more into it recently again. Upwell Consortium announces development of Citadel lines of station for Capsular Markets. Uh, by the way, we're now, we, we have covered our combined before, and so a lot of this stuff is going to kind of melt together. So hopefully we'll be able to pick up the pace a little bit. So get ready. Um, yeah. In related news reports emerging from the ongoing negotiations between Upwell Consortium and Ducia Foundry um, suggest that the notorious Arkham by Mercenary Group has been re retained by the partnership by for an unspecified security tasks. Responding to questions on these reports, Mortis Legion officials pointed out that they have considerable ongoing commitment to Legion troops on Caldari Prime and indicated that any contacts with additional private military co companies would assist with forced flexibility on other tasks. Press on, as to Caldari Prime operations, Mortis Legion confirmed that under no circumstances would Arkham by mercenaries be deployed for security duties on the planet. So, um, this is like obviously we have our combined confirmed at this point, but also um, just remember that this is again post the time period that they have now more or less confirmed that uh, the life giver, if it is who we think it is, um, has was already part of our combined by this point. Or membership of Upwell Consortium um, confirmed by. Yanni Sarateu in the aftermath of Station Caesars. <clears throat> More details on the operation carried out by Upwell mercenary forces are emerging. It now seems clear that our combined troops staged from the Kemaltech stations. Hey, it's like they've all known each other forever. And the outer ring has been massing at those locations under the cover of supply runs made by the Upwell members in the pre preceding days. Mortis Legion forces are believed to have stuck struck routes via, via routes from both Cloud Ring and Syndicate with indications that some Legion forces also used wormholes or sinusoidal fields to enter staging systems in Outer Ring. The lack of resistance in the ore stations believed to be due to a large-scale infiltration together with rather welcoming attitude of the, uh, on the part of the long-time ore employees. The overall impression given is that of an operation that is long in the planning with both military and financial points of view. Chairman Arteo, has publicly thanked Mortis Legion and Arcombine for their professionalism and exemplary conduct in these difficult and technically complex asset recovery operations. He went on to say, the Upwell Consortium Board is grateful to now have the opportunity of working with Orr on a sound legal footing, free of the taint of gross criminality, piracy, and terrorism that are the marks of the so-called Serpentis Corporation. Serpentis representatives were unavailable for content comment. However, this was not the end of the story. Shortly thereafter... As expected, after last week's recovery of ore stations from Serpentis Control, ore has joined its liberator, the Upwell Consortium. Despite the overwhelming success of the operation, carried out by Mordus Legion on behalf of Upwell, there are persistent rumors that the few Serpentis ships that managed to escape the onslaught took with them a considerable amount of valuable ore assets. Most notable are the very first blueprint copies of the Endurance ice mining frigates, developed under Orr's Frostline brand. The Endurance, seen here during its trials, is designed to mine ice in extremely hostile environments. Cloaking optimizations allow it to operate unprotected in null sec and even shattered wormhole systems. 
It is also able to fit a new type of extremely efficient ice mining laser, developed in conjunction with the Endurance, providing the first frigate class ice miner. Scope sources claim that Orr expects the Endurance to do well when it hits the market, fulfilling the needs of the more adventurous entrepreneurs. However, the mining tech company still has great concerns that the Serpentis are in possession of some of their most advanced technology. This is Alton Havery reporting for the scope. So this is when we went and like attacked all the Serpentis in order to get stuff for the second time in a day or in a year rather. <clears throat> December 16th, YC-117, which is 2015. Um, breaking news has reached the scope in the last hour detailing the coordinated set of armed strikes against the Ducia Foundry mining operations in the region of Outer Ring. Initial reports indicate that three joint task forces, Serpentis Corporation, Guardian Angels vessels, staged simultaneous ambushes on the heavily armed Ducia Foundry mining convoys in the system of 3HQC uh, TAC 6, L3 TAC XYO, and LGUZ TAC 1, destroying all mining vessels and ancillary hardware after laying waste to their escorts. Uh, hey! <laughs> nice. Thanks, Punch. Uh, Upwell Consortium has vehemently condemned the attacks in a statement and also confirmed one of the pirate task forces were pursued in destroying the system of 7TAC-692B by Mortis Legion Security Patrol. Uh, several witnesses of the firefight indicate that the Serpentis Corporation vessels were in full retreat back towards the border of their home region and fountain where they were set upon by Legion vessels, once again calling into question the Upwell Consortium's use of force with some critics labeling it as excessive. Remember, earlier in this year, Upwell Consortium began attacking the the, uh, the Serpentis shipyards after receiving the FIO dossier through the Deathless's agents. Um, and then that information was then handed over to Scope, which then began the Scope Brokering Network, um, which allowed us to attack the Serpentis. And then they used it again to have us attack the Serpentis again at the end of the year. So that's where we're at. Do I not have... Hold on. I do not have alerts showing on this on this theme. Sorry about that. You said, I was here for Or Mordu Reunion. Cue up Take My Power Back by Rage Against the Machine. Heck yeah. I'd play it, but, you know, copyright. Anyway. Uh, when approached by the scope with questions regarding the claims of excessive use of force, Strike Commander Sunni... Uh, Aina of Mortis Legion Command commented on, we have contracted <clears throat> have a contracted obligation to provide protection for assets belonging to the Upwell Consortium, and we'll continue to do so with every gram, gram of strength our assigned task force can muster. So, um, I, this is one of the things that's really nice about walking through the lore like this, is because we get to see how these same characters are coming over and over again, right? They keep reappearing. Serpentis fall back after failed assault on mining platform. So then the, at the beginning of the next year, AN TAC G54, the Serpentis Corporation appears to be in full retreat after a failed assault on Outer Ring Excavation's largest mobile mining and refining platform resulted in heavy losses for their fleet early yesterday morning. Reports are now beginning to emerge that the removal of communication blackout saw, that saw parts of the constellation in Regalia over in Outer Ring locked down by Mortis Legion Command Forces contracted by the Opal Consortium. The fortification and lockdown of several systems was put in place for more than 24 hours after a failed attack uh, on the Kubera, ore's largest and most valuable 8, million, uh, 8 billion ton combined ice and ore harvesting and processing platform, which was stationed in the system of ANTAC G54 at the time of the attack. Hey, Danny! Thank you for that. Danny says, show appreciation for Ash's work and leave a like. Thank you so much for your supporter membership. And uh, the reminder for everybody to like the stream, it really does help get it out there. Um, yeah. Reports indicate that the aging but heavily armed deep space platform was able to defend itself from the attacking fleet almost 30 minutes but, uh, and a broadcast and disrupt beacon that alerted Upwell security forces on the situation. Several sources have confirmed that the Serpentis Corporation f fielded a sizable capital fleet that was uh, met head-on by Mortis Legion capital vessels in what appears to have been an attempt to make a very public statement against the reacquisition of Orr's assets from Serpentis control over the course of the last few months. Limited telemetry released by the Upwell Consortium appears to show that the Serpentis Corporation escalated the engagement with the second wave of capital ships after the arrival of Mortis Legion's reinforcements before being beaten into retreat 
which concluded an engagement that lasted two hours. The largest mobile mining platform ever constructed, the Kubera, was launched in YC-98 as the flagship of the Outer Ring Excavations Resource Procurement Fleet and has apparently suffered from lack of funding and maintenance under the Serpentis Corporation's oversight of ore. Information from ore has confirmed that the platform was moored in ANTAC G54 to support Ducia Foundry mining operations in the area when the attack took place. Outer Ring Excavations has confirmed that the platform, along with two smaller harvesting platforms that were moored in the affected constellation, has been moved to an undisclosed location for repairs and rearming. Is this in the right time? Hold on. Yep. Recently surfaced Serpentis Capital Class blueprints have caused a stir in military circles across New Eden. Based on Galente Federation Navy designs, the vehement class dreadnought, Vendetta Class. I had it backwards. Oh my God, I can't believe that. I, I must have gotten it wrong so many times. So the attack on ore stations in Operation Frostline came first and Shadow of the Serpent came second? Class Supercarrier and the Vanquisher Class Titan deliver more firepower than their original Galente counterparts. In addition, they are optimized to support advanced stasis webifier and hybrid weapons technology. A well-known criminal corporation the Serpentis had intended to offer the blueprints to loyal capsuleers. That plan came under fire when their shipyards were located and raided. Today, with the assistance of the Scope Network's extensive broadcasting system, Concord is now making the locations of these shipyards public, stating that all equipment and construction materials recovered by capsuleers during raids on the shipyards to be classified as free salvage. In addition to this, Again, via the Scope Network, Concord is offering various rewards for the destruction of the identified Serpentis targets, including some of the rarest Serpentis blueprints that have ever been acquired. This is Alton Havery, reporting for the Scope. All right. <clears throat> Storm on Strike Force marks y Yanala Day with staggered leave. So we are now in 2018, okay? Arcurial Caldari Prime. Um, yeah, this is actually not a big deal. This is actually just like um, people are coming back to Caldari Prime to visit, and Mortis Legion is prepared to accept those mercenaries visiting Caldari Prime to military zone on the condition that they attend in a non combat clone. Uh, we cannot leave. So, yeah, not. Uh, not the most important Mordu news. Um, oh, okay. I just had this out of order too. And then August 9th, YC-120, which is 2018. Yesterday, Mordu's Legion Command Force on Caldari Prime underwent an abrupt change in leadership. The shift comes as a part of an overall new focus of the Legion prompted by the continued involvement of the Upwell Consortium, which continues to employ large numbers of Mordu's troop for installation of the colony's security roles. The changes directly affected the mercenary detachment on Kaldari Prime, previously under the leadership of Strike Commander Tsuni Aina, recently promoted Brigadier Gen General Majima Akuras, as well as uh, will instead take the reins. Hey, Akuras is back! Uh, reigns of the security forces on the Caldari homeworld. During his opening speech, General Akuras announced a, com a commitment to sweeping changes due to the evolving business model of the Legion. Clad in dressed uniform of the Legion Brigadier, the General's remarks uh, con contrasted with the lighthearted demeanor that some uh, deemed inappropriate given the responsibility of his new position. Among those were the state and federation rep representatives of the planet who expressed concern regarding the sudden change in leadership. General Akuras explained in no uncertain terms that the Legion becomes more involved in operations with Upwell Consortium. They will not be seeking to renew a number of their high-profile contracts. One of the examples touched on was the contract of the Joint Administration of Caldari Prime. So now that Upwell's come into power, or like uh, Mortis Legion isn't interested in wasting their time on Caldari Prime anymore. So after closing his speech, General Arcuris 
<coughs> open it for questions from press and uh, representatives. When pressed on details on how the shift in focus would affect Caldari Prime, Arcurius refused to comment. However, he did explain that the details will be revealed in the coming weeks. Mortis Legion Command reviews the contract. The Shikone and Material Acquisitions representatives present, present noted that they had expected to enter negotiations and renew their contract earlier this year. However, representatives explained that prior negotiations talks had met in several delays uh, as senior Legion personnel began to rotate to other postings. One Shikone representative remarked, quote, today is General Akura's first day in his new position, and he alludes to a previously unannounced renegotiation rather than a simple renewal agreement. We politely differ with the suggestion that Caldari Prime's security contract may be considered less important than the security of the Upwell Consortium's commercial operations, but we are confident in his ability. Under the tenure of the strike commander Tsuni Ana, the planet's paramount military, mil uh, paramount military authority, Caldari Prime has seen a decline in the interfactional violence and unrest due to no smart, small part to Mortis Legion. Commander Ana, a 30-year veteran in Mortis Legion, was recently nominated for a promotion as part of the Legion's shift in focus. According to a representative for Legion Command, Ana's record of excellence in peacekeeping operations in Caldari Prime is the primary contributing factor for to her escalations in rank. That's to her. Uh, though her new duties remain undisclosed for security reasons, Mortis Legion represents suggestions that Commander Ana will be ta taking on a new role as the Legion headquarters in 5Z XX Tech K, where she will be working directly with Legion founder Moria Mordu on the for, for the foreseeable future. Commander Ana will be taking her new post in the coming weeks as General Arcturus becomes oriented in his new position. Generally esteemed General uh Akuris has been a member of the Legion for the better part of a century. A decorated veteran holding both the Legion's gold and silver clusters, Akuris served as a commander for the Legion's 5th Night Soccer Dreadnought Task Force, and YC-107 he briefly took over as common flight commander before being placed in charge of operations in Pure Blind. He remained in the position until recent promotion to Brigadier General and subsequent shift to Caldari Prime. Hey, we knew all that! The Caldari Prime, the, uh, on Caldari Prime, the material acquisitions in Ishikone corporations retain administration control over the Federation state districts, respectively, and cooperate in a joint administration on planetary affairs. The two have what they claimed is a long-held satisfactory relationship with the Legion's mercenaries. However, that satisfactory relationship, for now, remains the subject of debate since the arrival of the new commander, who appears to have a mandate to renegotiate the security contract. And that is where things were when the world ended. Uh, it is about that time that... Hold on. So, oh, actually, this is before that. Okay, great. Let's go into this. So, October 5th, YC-120. Concord's Inner Circle rep uh, is reported to a meeting to discuss the recent space spate and ship disappearances across the board's broad swath of New Eden from the from Meridia to Molten Heath regions. It is understood that Colonel Kashia Valkanir, heading up DED's investigation, investigative task force will be briefing the inner circle on our findings and recommendations. News of the special meeting broke today when it emerged that Samatar Maltu Shakur has dispatched his personal representative, Director Kaiten Yun, of the uns uh, to an unscheduled rendezvous with the inner circle in Yulai. Kaiten Yun, recently named director of Samatar's tribal intelligence apparatus, is a controversial figure even within Midmatar Republic, and the scope received notice of his movement from several sources. Confirmation of a meeting of the full inner circle came with the departure from Sarum Prime of Captain Marshal Sir Den Sarkosh, the Amar member of the Inner Circle, cutting short a visit with Lord Arak Sorum on behalf of Empress Catus I. The Sorum royal, royal heir's relationship to the Empress is, are known uh, to observers of the Amar politics to be somewhat cool. The Captain Marshal's visit, officially in regards to how Sorum's contribution to the, the, the Auxiliaries, is believed to have been principally intended as that of mutually respected figure bridging the gap in relations. And returning to Yulai, Captain Marshal Zirkosh evidently cut short an important matter of state in order to attend the Inner Circle gathering. Inquiries to the Office of Inner Circle President Siri Okanaya has been met with the pro forma no comment responses. However, the scope has learned that Colonel Kashia Valkanir will be attending the meeting in a briefing at the Inner Circle on developments concerning the ship disappearances personally. A single source 
claiming familiarity with Colonel Valconeer's area of competence, has suggested the DED officer that it recommended new space lane security measures to, it, for the regions bordering zero security space. Another confidential source has indicated that Morty's Legion and the Upwell Consortium and D Department of Friendship and Mutual Assistance has been invited to attend, providing diplomatic services of Upwell Consortium members. The DFMA is also known to be Upwell's security and counter espionage organization. The Scopes Rhett Gloriax of the Galactic Hour with Rhett Gloriax has requested an interview with Colonel Valconeer. As of yet, Colonel has not responded to this request. The Galactic Hour with Rhett Gloriax will continue to bring updates on this developing story. This is what is known as Case Green Magic. Uh, it was originally suspected to be Serpentis, or not Serpentis, Sancha, but it is believed now to be related to the Triglavian uh, Collective. Uh... So the next year, in the next, so, <clears throat> sorry, by this time, uh, the Triglavian Collective had been identified by, um, it was YC-121, so it was in, one, or, I guess it was YC-128. Was it? No, it's this, right? Hold on. When did Invasion happen? Or when did uh, uh, Eve Online Abyss? No. Um, what was the expansion called? Was it just the Into the Abyss? Okay. I do not have time for this. May okay, so Into the Abyss happened in May 29th, 2018. So the Triglavians had been here for just about a year up until this point, right? Uh, when and yeah, a year up until this point. Heads up, I'm activating the abyssal filament. If you need to reload kinetic ammo and group weapons, do it now. Kinetic ammo? What are you talking about? I brought thermal. I got thermal ammo with me. You stole my thermal! Uh, come on, we went over this. It's super simple. It's a dozen ships, we kill them, grab the loop, and have for the execute. Alright guys, keep your stuff together. Here we go.
And unfortunately, we are going to have to call this here. Uh, I guess tomorrow, hopefully, we will return for part two of uh, the Mortis Legion Invasion and Beyond. Although I have covered a lot of this stuff in a lot of other uh, aspects, including the... I have a uh, speed run of the lore, which I think is a very good one, uh, and uh, other videos that you can check out on my YouTube with playlists and everything else. Or you can come onto the Discord and ask some questions um, and get involved in the current events. Because everything we talked about here are seeds of what is happening today. And now, uh, if you're still here, you know way too much about the Mortis Legion. Um, you know, today we learned that, like, the connections between the Mordu and Serpentis and Or, and how uh, crazy that history has. And we, we've laid out how Mordu went from working predominantly with Or to then taking contracts with SOE and some other people, uh, leading to uh, becoming the security forces for both the Intaki and the Kaldari Prime, which they've ended both of those contracts now so as to focus 100% on Upwell and now the current forces against the Deathless and the Insurgencies. So uh, I hope this was good for you guys. Let me know if you liked it or if there's anybody else you'd like me to cover uh, like this. And did I miss anything? Was there anything important? One thing I do know is that Mordu was involved in the um, the uh, uh, the Ishiko or the the Intaki Five takeover by Lydai, which I think comes later, but either way. But like, is there anything from the past that I covered? Um, do you like Mordu? You know, do you have any knowledge about Mordu that I may not have uh, talked about today? Fun facts, trivia, whatever, put it down below. Thank you guys so much. But all that said, I've been Ashrothy. I've been playing this game since 2010, talking about it since 2012, and I'm here, but even to contact for you, my fellow Perians. Thank you guys so much. Thank you for staying for all this. This was a long one, guys. And my voice is shot, and my son's going to be home in like five minutes. So with all that said, thank you. And I have been the vo uh, the I've been Ashrathi, the voice of New Eden. And until next time, I'll see you in space. Like the stream and share it with other people. This is how people get to know about these things. If anybody ever tells you Eve lore is stupid and doesn't go anywhere, this is the kind of video. And they'll go like, oh, but it's three hours. Like, oh, okay. Well, then it's not nothing, huh? Uh, yeah. Either way. Oh, seven. Bye, merch. See